coming out and taking interest in county business. As you can tell, I'm not Chairman Thompson. He called me today, and he's a bit under the weather today, so I want to remember him today, and, and uh, we'll move on to the, the meeting. The first order of business, I'll have uh, Supervisor Marshall Jamison will have our invocation, led by the Pledge of Allegiance by Supervisor Carter. Will, please stand. I'd like to welcome to everybody here. I'm glad you see everybody coming out. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we just come to you with a thankful heart, Lord. We thank you for your unchanging love, Lord, your shed blood, your healing stripes, and your saving grace, Lord. Lord, I'd just like to lift up the victims of the shooting. I just ask a quick recovery for those injured. Lord, I pray that you'd comfort and strengthen and get the family of the gentleman that was killed. Lord, get it through it. Thank you for the protection of Donald Trump, Lord. Wasn't no abortion it was. Dear God, I lift up our nation to you, Lord. It seems a lot of division. I just pray, Lord, you could pull it together, Lord, and unify everybody and get us moving all in the right direction under your, your guidance. Lord, I just lift up this board myself, Lord, as we go about the county's business. We pray for guidance, Lord, for wisdom, discernment, and just guide us through each, each decision we have to go through. We give you the praise and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Approval of the agenda. Anyone have any questions or modifications they'd like to make on today's agenda? Okay, seeing none, do I have a motion that we approve today's agenda? I will, Mr. Chair. Okay, do we have a second? Second. All right, we have a motion and a second that we approve the agenda. Uh, can we do that on voice vote or do you need a roll? Voice vote. All in favor, we approve today's agenda. Let me know I'm saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. All right, moving right along. Discussion with VDOT. Brian, if you'll come forward. And <laughs> Miss Lisa. There's Miss Lisa. We're tag teaming. All we right. Since we get to see you all twice in one week, we'll just both come up here. Hey, well, we feel special. Yeah. And we're sorry, right, Tim? <laughs> no, it's our we're pleasure to be here. <laughs> so, um, Chairman Thompson invited us to be here to talk about the new speed limit law, the House Bill 1071 passed in the General Assembly this year. Um, we don't really have, an, a, say, an agenda or anything or a presentation. We were planning on answering some questions if there were any, but certainly I'll go over the highlight of it. Um, basically, this bill allows any uh, locality, county, city, town that uh, in the state of Virginia to change the speed limit on a roadway. The key is the roadway must be posted at 25 miles per hour, be in a residential district or a business district. Um, so that's really the big picture it, in a nutshell. There's some logistical things that we get into. Um, GDOT's still working on a, an implementation guide for us to, uh, through our traffic section to um, give some feedback to the localities on maybe whether a road is appropriate or not. Uh, there is a land use permit that would be applied for, so there's a process. Um, but basically, the locality would give us a 30-day notice that they have an interest in reducing a speed limit. Could be something as such as a, a neighborhood, um, and it can go down to no less than 15 miles per hour. So it's started at 25. That's all we will post, uh, but the locality can decide on their own that they can do 20 or 15. So. I think those are the big highlights. Um, the one key with that is uh, the, the locality is really responsible for all the costs associated with that. So that's you know procuring it, uh, purchasing, installing, maintaining. So be aware that that perpetual maintenance is a, is going to be on the county's burden. Um, and in addition to maybe posting something such as say 20 or 15 miles per hour it may involve additional signs uh, and what i mean by that is you know on some of our roadways we have curb warning signs and these are what we call ball banked it's a device you put on your dashboard and ride and if it gets to a certain degree based on a speed then you have to post that if it's say a 55 mile an hour roadway or unposted roadway 
um, you'd have to post those curve warning advisory signs with the speed. So it could involve additional signs. Uh, I guess in addition to that, if you have some kind of signal involved or you have a higher speed that is transitioning down, say for example, you have a 55, well, we would, we would step those speeds down in transitions, probably thousand foot increments or so. Uh, so you'd go from 55, say to 40, then ultimately down to 25. So there would be an, an additional transition zone if you found yourself, or if we find ourselves in a situation trying to get to 15, you wouldn't jump from say, 40 to 15 that's just too much of a drop at once so I, I say all that because it's that's the bigger picture um but it does give the locality some um, ability to to lower the speed limit so with that do you have anything else um i would like to say because there were some questions i had i deal with this, i deal with this a lot on my end because i deal with the traffic studies um um i lost my train of thought <laughs> um the bottom line is you know, I don't know that you all have the manpower to do that, nor do you probably want to take that on. I mean, that's just, you know, I'm not telling you what to do, but we get overwhelmed with those kind of requests. So um, just to let you know what I have to deal with when I get those, I mean, you know, and we, and you know, a lot of those that we get, it is because we get folks who think, you know, they want to walk on their road, um, you know, and, and that's, that's fine. That is a risk you take. Uh, because it's for vehicular traffic but uh, that's just one of the things that I wanted to say the permitting process right now we don't know we'll find out more but we don't know if that's going to be a fee for you all because our typical fee is a hundred dollars so is that a hundred dollars each time you all want to do this or are we able to waive that we, we don't have a lot of those answers so um, yeah to maybe. that we are expecting some guidance uh, back in I mean coming out in August we'll get the we're supposed to get a copy of the new land use permit um, for the speed limit reduction stuff and I think it's going to have some guidance in there relative to these types of things mm -hmm. but Lisa's right we get a lot of work orders that come in and we don't report on those things for you all but just customers calling in and we'll call and discuss the issue with them and decide whether we need to do a new speed study or safety study or if something's been done in the recent years and there's no new development we would just relay that message to them so there's a lot goes into it it really is yeah all right. Anyone have any questions? Okay. okay. Dan, go ahead. I have a couple of questions. So the only authority we would have is to bring the speed speed limit down from whatever it is to something at 25 or lower, right? That's what you're saying? That's what the, I'm saying. Yeah, it would have to be posted at 25. Uh, right. And okay. then you can bring it down lower than that to no less than 15. Oh, the road today would have to be posted at 25. Correct. Okay, correct. so it has. there's no authority for anything over 25. Correct. That's oh, correct. Okay. And then, and that's a good point to make mm -hmm. clear because mm -hmm. that was new to us when we saw mm -hmm. this guidance coming out. And then the second question is: so can we still rely on you to do your speed limit studies? Because that's my preference. I'm not a speed engineer. I, you know, I would still prefer to go through you to make those decisions rather than yeah. us making those decisions. Me, yeah. me personally. That, that's where I lost my train of thought. Yeah. Sorry. Um, you guys have the you don't have to do this like you can still depend on us yeah. if you want so yeah. okay. that's the one point i wanted to make because that was one of my questions do they have to do this yeah we'll do a speed study safety study whatever kind of study based on you all's request that's no problem at all we don't do it for private developments but we do do it for the board and for the general good of the public mm -hmm. thank you okay, sir Good Smith. So I'm guessing that um, with an example of you guys doing a traffic study and your results come back and as an example, maybe I don't like it, then we've got the authority um, under the state to go ahead and do 15 to 25 on our own volition or Only does the traffic study trump that? Well, if we do a traffic study, we we're going to make a recommendation, and it would not be less than 25. So it would only go to 25. Likely, just depends on the nature of the roadway, volumes, all that kind of stuff. We look at crash histories. Um, so you would have the ability, if we wanted to post it at 25, you would have the ability to post it at 20 or 15, even if you would like. But that's it. It has to be posted. And I say that um, there are some statutory speed limits, like. There's a lot of neighborhoods, older neighborhoods that are out there. By, by state code, their residential density uh, requires their 25 mile an hour roads. Now, it may not have a speed limit on it. So in that situation, what we would do is 
we don't want to go out there and put a 25 mile an hour speed limit up just to have you come back and put a 15 or a 20. So we can work together on that and help identify those areas where they're, they're statutory 25, we can say that. We have a subdivision, we're getting ready to put one in now that's um, been out there for, for quite a few years and we're gonna go ahead and put a speed limit up um, just because folks have questioned about it. But um, if you get in those situations where it's a high density residential or business use, you can let us know and we can coordinate, you can give us the coordination so that we don't find ourselves putting up a 25 and then the <clears throat> county coming in behind doing something less that just it would look silly so in terms of process brian um if we have citizens that are aware of this and they come to us with a direct request um, am i hearing that you all would prefer that these requests would it be more you know would it be simplified if we just maintained the current process that we have with a call to you guys to say we need to look at this collaboratively um, and, and just keep doing things the way we're doing? I would agree with that. I think that's probably the best position for all of us. And let this evolve, um, let this grow. I'm not sure the nature behind this bill. Um, I don't mm -hmm. think it came from around here, but uh, I can see it in some areas where you have a lot of pedestrian activity. Um, maybe that makes sense in the areas, but. Uh, but certainly we can do business as usual um, again we wouldn't post anything less than 25 so if the citizen approaches you and wants a 10 mile an hour speed limit or even a 15 that's not something we're going to recommend so <coughs> with regard to who pays for what you're saying that there may be an application fee of a hundred dollars that would be um, the responsibility of the locality that's correct yeah we'll find out more when the land use permit itself comes out with the the whole process and the provisions within the, the permit so we'll find out if there's a fee or not but typically there's a hundred dollar application fee for so all. how does that differ from what we're for how we do business financially on things like road signs and speed studies mm, Who's, we are we paying for those no, no it's not coming out of secondary roads mm, or no, tele fees no it, it, all that time gets budgeted out of our salem district for our traffic section if we employ them to do a study for us so will we have to pay for the signs? If, the signs come out of our, our yeah, local. they come out of our local budget, yeah. but that's so it's just the hundred dollar fee we're looking at. Yeah, potentially. Now I do when I permit you all to do like a welcome to sign, we waive that. Uh, so I'm just giving you kind of the worst case scenario because right. I don't know. But when I permit you to do work in the right of way, such as the you know what's going on with the business park, or just to use that as an example, we typically charge you all a hundred dollar fee. Because we've been very, um, I think, apprehensive about the state again passing down more unfunded mandating uh, financial uh, pressures on the locality. So, um, you know, if things stay the same, the hundred dollar fee is, as of today, what we're looking at. Potentially. Potentially, that yeah, would be that's the worst, a case, worst case scenario, and that doesn't mean we don't, you know, just charge one, uh, maybe do like a blanket permit and right. just keep that on file. Okay. You know, right. We we. There's ways to do things. Again, this is kind of out of, we're not setting the rules, so we hope by August 1st we have more information. Thank you very much. Thanks, okay. Mr. Chair. All right, has that generated any questions on this side? All right, see you then. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right. Uh, <coughs> as you're aware, Tuesday we moved one item to this <coughs> afternoon, and that was a request by Supervisor Quinn and it's a budget strategy recommendation by Supervisor Quinn. So, floor is yours. Okay, good. Thank you very much. So, <coughs> just a little bit of background. We had about an eight-week uh, budget review session this year, and coming out of that review session, I thought about some changes that I thought would be healthy for us to consider for next year. So, just to be clear, none of these changes affect the current year budget. They're they're all for the our budget review process. <coughs> next year and so there are four ideas here and just to be clear each idea is unique all by itself it's not um the ideas aren't intertwined i feel that we could vote on each idea and each idea could pass or fail on its own merits and so uh, <coughs> in may i reviewed the ideas then in june i asked if they'd be put on the agenda because i realized without us boarding voting as a board they wouldn't be acted on and so the purpose today was and then I put together this um, 
I'll just call it a, an executive summary that's in the book. And the purpose for today was to open it up if there are any comments. And then my hope is that we could just vote on each item. Okay. So the first of, of four items was the Board of Supervisors should oversee the school capital and expense budget process from initial budget presentation to the final budget approval rather than delegating this responsibility to the county. And there was a lot of background and I know we just have 15 minutes for the topic. Um, I'm not sure if anybody would like to make comments or they have questions or, um, or how you'd like to deal with this, but I'll just open the floor on this first one. If you wanna go ahead and, and highlight your proposal there and just give us your thoughts on it. We've read it, but okay. I'll, I'll get your thoughts on it. Yeah, so the main thoughts were that it's a $100 million budget. It's, it's a lot of money. So it wasn't a $1 or $2 million budget. And one of the concerns I had is that in the end, when a tax cut was proposed or a budget cut, a, a cut was proposed to their proposed budget, we had no feedback on how that would impact uh, the school. And I thought that was really important. And so I felt that in the future, this would give us an opportunity to have a dialogue with, this, with the school. So I don't see us as micromanaging the school budget. It's more an interactive process where we would understand if we cut the budget, um, this is how much, um, this is what would happen to it. Much like we did with the county this year where we proposed a certain cut and the, the county went back and studied their budget and came back with recommendations to accommodate that cut. I would imagine, I would envision us doing the same thing with the school. So that's the first uh, big change. The second, is when I look at the school budget uh, that was proposed to us, it was not complete. The capital budget was not complete. So one example, we got the study that indicated that Snow Creek has HVAC components that are more than twice their useful life and that it's likely that we'll need to spend $5 million there. And yet that money was not in the capital budget. And so I would envision us asking them to provide a capital budget that was comprehensive, that included all the schools, that included all the expectations. So those are the two big changes I would see coming out of it if it were done this year. I guess my question on this, if we uh, take this oversight position uh, a more proactive oversight position than we already have. Uh, I get my question to Brian. Is that going to put more workload on you and your staff? <clears throat> I think, <clears throat> uh, Mr. Tatum, it depends on the details of that. Uh, I think it just depends on the board. If the board is going to expect county staff to review all of the items the schools present, yes. If the board is going to expect the school staff to present all of this information directly to the board, uh, then likely not. Um, I mean, I think ultimately, county staff uh, is always going to uh, is responsible for the overall budget, which includes the school budget. So, of course, there'll be some level of analysis, but it, it really is going to depend on the detail <clears throat> and the preference of the board as to how that is presented to you. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Dan, I'm going to have to get you to clear something up for me. So we're using, for example, Snow Creek Elementary has an HVAC system that's twice its its life, and I understand that. But you're, And I remember the schools giving us a list of capital needs that they needed. It was a long list. And I remember at one time we had a, a – Lori, do you remember what that dollar was? I think it was well over $10 million. And I remember they, they gave us one and it included the, it included the um, CTE building, but when we took that out of it, it was still up in the millions. And so, Dan, what you're, what you're suggesting here, are you saying that they should have presented us all of those needs, wanting them funded in our budget? No, they, they presented us with um, a forward plan, right, over I think it was five or six years and they showed all the expected expenditures in the forward plan. And when they did that, it, it did include some capital, but it was not complete because during that review, I, I cited this example. I said, well, you showed us this. It was a school study they had to show which schools could, could close. Mm -hmm. And in that school study, it showed this HVAC, 
HVAC expenditure, and, and yet that was not in there. And so I mentioned that to them, and, and they agreed that it wasn't complete, but they never came back with a complete plan. Mr. Tatum, can I take a sure. swing at this? Mm -hmm. And I, Dan, if you're... Well, I, I, I guess I my thing you. about it is I'm, I'm not seeing... I'm not... It sounds to me we're making a request of the schools to give us a more a more thought out list maybe is the word I'm looking for but but it, whether it be the county or the schools we all have a long list of things that we would love to see it budgeted I guess what you're asking for here is a more complete list of capital needs from the school system to be considered for the budget or well this is this is likely to be uh, it's it's not an expenditure we'll have a choice about right this the HVAC will fail and it, it's not a discretionary item, right? You, you will, it's gonna happen in the middle of the winter and you're gonna have to spend this money, right? And it, it shouldn't be a surprise to us because we'd say, oh, it was in the capital budget, right? This, this stuff is already two times past its useful life. So it shouldn't be a surprise that this money's in the budget. $5 million, $5 million would be in the budget. But it's not in there today. Right, but if you don't have it, you don't have it, which I guess comes back to the same problem we had at the East Hall at the middle school where they were renting that portable unit to do the air there that they were paying thousands of dollars a month to rent, and it just is what it is. Let me take a swing at this that I think might help, and Dan, you tell me if I'm getting this wrong. When I read this, what I'm seeing is that there perhaps is just a need the school board presents their budget to us, right? And they do it the same evening that Mr. Whitlow presents the county budget. I think this is inferring that the board of supervisors sit down with the school board in a joint meeting once uh, the school board um, has <coughs> gone into deliberating their budget uh, after their presentation and sit around and talk about and defend, if necessary, their requests for increases um, and then, as an example, provide the consequences if certain things don't get funded. Um, but to have a dialogue so that the board understands, as an example, under current practice, if the county administrator comes in and says, um, level fund the schools, right, um, and the school board came in for $900,000, well, and if we had a joint discussion about that, then they would be able to sit in front of us and say, what is the $900,000? What, what is it for? Really tell us about it. Let's discuss it. What happens if it's not funded? And then the capital budget's going to follow in the same thing. But I envision this, Dan, and you tell me if I'm getting this wrong. I don't think it's about getting in the weeds over how they do their capital budget. I think it is more or less an overview discussion so that we understand the consequences of increases or <clears throat> decreases that we may see need to be made and an understanding so that we've got some internal controls as a board of supervisors um, that would take place after Chris gives his recommendations. Am I getting that no, that's, right? No, that's good. And it, if you think about all of the individual sessions that we had over an eight week period where we studied the county budget, I'm not even suggesting we would go through that rigor, but this, the county budget before this time around was 73 million. The, the school is almost $100 million, and we're not, we're not giving it the due diligence that we could in terms of a, a review and this kind of interactive discussion with the school. And then especially, it was especially concerning when it came to the cuts, because before we cut, I would want to know what happened? What, what happens if we make that cut? We cut a million dollars, what happens? What, what are the implications of cutting a million dollars? I would want that feedback before I actually gave that cut to the proposed budget. Gloria. Yes, sir. To your scenario, <clears throat> we, they give us the information. How comfortable are you with the information you give from the school board? Um, well, when it comes to the budget, you're asking me a wide open question there, aren't you? <laughs> yes, ma'am, I am. Yes, and I, I appreciate that. And I don't. I'm, I'm, <clears throat> I'm saying that because I don't. Well, I mean, we sit here for February, March with the budget, and the school says, well, you give us this funding, and we will not close these two schools till the school year 25-26. On a split vote, we gave them the money. Eight days later, they closed the two schools. Right, right. Now, you know, I know things change, but... If they do change, I would think they should come to us and say, hey, look, do the right thing. 
we had a problem here. We've got a, we got another route we can go. We want to let you know. This is what we're going mm -hmm. to do. Explain ourselves. And we're not getting that. Mm -hmm. No, and, and I can't argue with that. And it was very disappointing to me, clearly. All I would suggest with Dan's proposal, perhaps, is that we have that direct eye-to-eye -eye interaction with the school board. And we can, you know I mean, we can place upon them the emphasis and the intensity of what we're talking about. And then if something, it, I mean, if something happens like happened this past spring, you know, we deal with it. But in the absence <clears throat> of having some type of uh, interface with the school board as it relates to increases and decreases, we're just kind of taking a little bit of risk there given where we've been this year. So is it going to, is it going to be a sealed deal with 100% trust? Probably not. I mean, probably not to start with. It's just an added layer of understanding what we as a board are going to recommend uh, in terms of the proposed budget from the county administrator if it's an increase or if it's a level fund or if it's actual a decrease so that we can get our hands in it and ask direct questions and observations and you know we've got to we don't have to fully trust uh, what we're hearing because we've been burned a couple of times but we'll have the opportunity to dig into it and roll our sleeves up a little bit and, and I think that relationship, Marshall, is very, very important. And their budget is, you know, a hundred million dollar budget on average. And I think that we've got to be better than what we've been this past spring. There's no question in my mind. And I'm not willing to take a step back and say, well, I don't trust the school board, so we're just gonna leave things the way they are. Mm -hmm. I think we've got to try to put some parameters in place that force the discussion so that we have the level of transparency, discussion, and accountability so that we feel when we make a decision and vote on the school's part of their budget that we know what we're doing in terms of what the expectations are. Mm -hmm. Does that generate any other questions? Go ahead, Mike. I agree with a lot of the comments here, and I think a lot of this makes sense in a perfect world, but, but we don't live in that world. And the bottom line is we can give them $100 million and they can give it to teachers' raises, they can buy school buses. We have absolutely no control over that money once we give it to them. So I think that doing this is going to be more work for us, more work for the staff, uh, more work for the school system. And regardless of what they tell us or we tell them, bottom line is once we vote on this and the budget's done and we give them the money, they're going to do what they want to with it. I mean, they've proven that time and time again in the <clears throat> past. And I, I just think this is going to create uh, a more dubious budget process for ourselves and county staff. That's just my opinion. For me, I think it's unfortunate that we have two boards that serve the citizens of Franklin County, and we have two boards that straight up don't trust each other. And, and, and it is unfortunate, <clears throat> and I can tell you, <clears throat> on December the 28th, I met with the chairman of the school board and the superintendent of public schools, and both of them told me that they had no plans to close any schools. And then I also had, they told us that if we give, if we give them this money, that it would buy them some time and they wouldn't have to close schools. And so we voted and we gave them the money to get them over the, over the hump. And less than two weeks later, they voted to close schools anyway. And then the comments were made in the school board meeting, well, since we're not using the money to keep, that the Board of Supervisors gave us to keep the schools open, are we gonna give that money back to the county? <clears throat> and the comment was made by a school board member, no, that's our money now, we'll spend it any way we want to. So to say that there's some mistrust, I think that mistrust, especially as far as the mistrust that I hold, I think that mistrust was earned. And, I, and, and I've been on this board for eight and a half years and, and you can't, there's no one up here that can say that they've supported the school board more fervently than I have. I mean, I support the school board uh, and took great criticism for it. But when I get lied to, 
I take offense to it. And that, that's kind of the way I feel on this. I, I think we need to do a, a, a more thorough job at looking through their requests and, and paying attention to these requests. But at the end of the day, like Mike said, once we approve it, it's their money. They can do whatever they want to with it, and they've proven that. And uh, I guess I don't know where I'm at on if this is going to add extra <clears throat> work on our staff or, uh, you know, I, I think we can do a better job of, as a board, at looking at these requests and build a more thorough in the way we, you know, we look into them. But uh, with that said, we have a proposal in front of us, board. What's your pleasure on it? Can I, can I make the motion or should I? You sure can. I'll, I'll make the motion that in the future, the Board of Supervisors will work with the school board and Franklin County Public Schools to review their annual budget and negotiate the annual budget to a conclusion. Okay. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Okay. We don't have a second. We can take a vote. Madam Clerk, will you take a roll call on this, please? Supervisor Jamison? No. Supervisor Mitchell? No. Supervisor Carter? No. Supervisor Smith? No. Vice Chair Tatum? No. And Chairman Thompson's absence for the vote. And you missed Supervisor Quinn. Oh, sorry, Supervisor Quinn. Oh, yes. All right, moving right along. There's a second proposal. Mr. Quinn, would you like to share with us on that? Yes, so I'll do the same thing. So uh, I believe that the Board of Supervisors, in conjunction with the county, should develop a process to consider Board of Supervisor recommendations for changes to the budget. So this year, as I think about the eight-week period, there were a number of ideas that were brought up. Uh, but they were never voted on, so they never became part of the budget. And I, I could go through a long list, but I'll just pick a couple examples. And one was where Marshall suggested that there should be a cost share on the employee health plan. And so not that I support that or don't support it, but it was an idea that was I think was worth voting on. But because it's not voted on, it just doesn't become part of the budget and so uh, and a second one would be at one point Lori suggested that the economic development director really needed more administrative support because they were completely drowning in support uh, admin work and so again I'm not saying I agree or disagree with the idea but it seemed worthwhile that we would vote on it and so the idea here is that each year um, each supervisor could have maybe, I, I, and I haven't worked out the details, but have two or three ideas that they could bring up, and it would be in this forum, and they could describe their ideas, and the other supervisors could either oppose the idea or support it, but at the end, you would vote on it, and if it passed, it would be included. If it didn't pass, it wouldn't be included, and so the idea was to have a methodology where a supervisor could bring up an idea and it would be voted on and either included or not included in the budget. Anyone have any questions or comments? Part to this. I have one question. Go ahead. Um, uh, Mr. Quinn, do you envision this process to look something like an add delete exercise that what I would be used to doing where the board just works through a discussion when it comes to uh, additions or deletions that a supervisor would want to see and they just get put up on the board and we go through each one, they go, it gets put in or it doesn't. Yeah, something like that. An add yeah. delete type exercise. Or, or change, I would even say change. Uh, but yes, something like that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman, go ahead. I like the idea. Uh, I, like I said, we always, you, you said discussion in there. Just like what I said before, we had some an informal discussion around the table. I said, you know, when I come on, I'm new. I'm sitting here and we're going through the budget and I'm watching Chris and he's going like this right here all the way around <laughs> the room. And I, 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 I'm taking it he's getting the consensus of the board. Uh, if it, 
something come up like this? I think that would, would that not help you? Yeah, I think so. Um, Mr. Jamison and Ms. Smith, you, you mentioned the add delete exercise. And, and I think Mr. Quinn had made me kind of your intentions there and, and so forth. And I think that that's very well said, add delete, because, you know, all of us have different ideas about what we should be doing in respective departments and so forth. Oh, that would be a good idea and this, that, and the other, like the, the administrative piece for economic development, which we've restructured where the Franklin Center support staff will be providing a lot of that administrative mm -hmm. support down to economic development as one example. But then, you know, other examples. So anytime that, you know, you, you may add to a specific departmental budget or line item, um, the, when, the, when the budget's presented, it's presented as a balanced budget with the revenues and expenditures. So you're, you're, you, you may be given to one, but you're, you're going to have to find in the budget to take away from another. And that could be done in, you know, different exercises. We, we've done that in previous years. Maybe not to the granular level of line items within budgets, but you know, as an example, when we were going through the Great Recession um, way back when, um, we were really deciding how are we going to balance this county budget, and we went through an entire exercise and a couple of work sessions with the board at that time. It's it's been several years ago where we would add, you know, user fees would would, would help, or this tax, this penny on personal property would help cover, you know, that increase and so forth. But it was a um, it was a well thought out exercise. It, it worked well at that time that we went through that in, in, in terms of a work session format. So, Mr. Jamison, you're exactly right. When when we have the discussion during the work sessions after the budget is presented I am looking for consensus you know is is it are, are there four you know <laughs> of the seven at least four that may say hey yeah we, we need to do this uh, and and if not then you know we we don't spend our time to to make that change and, and, and so forth and we did a little bit of that towards the end of the budget if you all recall when we had to come back and we went from 45 cents to 43 cents and staff provided kind of that list of some recommendations that the board you know gathered back at the end to to approve the budget in that way but we we can come back with some ideas and thoughts uh, on that process, uh, and I know Mr. Quinn, you noted maybe from each board member two to three different recommendations, and you know if, if that's the pleasure of the board, we could have a work session and, and, and go through that type of exercise. Um, it 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 would certainly help from a staff standpoint, you know, to know that up front going into the budget, whatever the board wishes to do this year, you know, so we can prepare as staff, you know, from from our standpoint of how we can help facilitate that, whatever that ever how that may look like. Mr. Vice Chair, if I'm just Go ahead. Mr. Whitlow, I mean, if you can, I guess the illustration that I would give the board is what I'm used to is you literally have a, your baseline bottom number, right, for revenue and expenses. And then you literally have a movement and levers being pulled. If you add this, it's going to do this to your revenue. So you got to go find somebody that brings it back up to here. So it is a visual, literal illustration of what you're doing to the budget when you're adding things and then or subtracting things and looking at how what what is the impact you're doing and what do you need to do to bring it back into balance mm -hmm. i think it's a great i think it's a healthy exercise a couple of years ago we were uh, discussing the budget and i carter was there and I think you were there. I think that was after you, you was on the board. And we met in the back and we were discussing, we were adding and, and Mr. Car uh, Brian Carter was back there and he had up on the board. And when we would add something, he's, and you see the numbers changing. Yeah. And then he said, okay, how are we gonna pay for it? So we'd have to go over here and, <laughs> and add you know, a fee here. And I think we did some fees at the landfill and stuff to, to bring it back. And, and <laughs> so I think that, that idea, we probably need to do more exercises like that if you know uh, it, it would help us to be more visual with it and understand it and get a better grasp and um, any, any other thoughts on this I think just discussing it would help me I mean uh, my bright idea that I come up with when I hear discussion might not have been so bright I mean, you can shed light on it you know what I mean and I think I think it'd be very good I think it's a good idea uh, I like the idea uh, even if if we don't have to create a lot of work for Mr. Carter, if we just put up a whiteboard and say, "I want a, two new fire trucks and an ambulance or whatever you want," and Dan puts up there what he wants, and then we go through it and discuss it as a board and say, "Well, how are we going to pay for that?" I, I think it's a good idea. All right. 
Any other questions or comments? Okay, do we need to make this a, a formal motion and actually vote on it with action or? I don't think it really needs to be a formal vote, does it? What I would say, there we go. What I would say is, you know, that, that, that certainly pushes the board. I know, you know, Mr. Quinn has, you know, offered this. I, I will say, um, the earlier of this exercise, the better. You know, I envision this even as we get into October, November, uh, where we'll be having our strategic planning session in September. But when we kick off the budget, the budget calendar and the budget exercise, uh, really start thinking through, all right, what, what are some of the two or three priorities from each of the seven board members and kind of get that out. And then that's very instructive and helpful, quite honestly, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Mr. Quinn and, and members of the board to staff, you know, for us as we build the budget, it's very welcomed and very helpful. And then, you know, as we get in after the budget is then presented, um, this add delete type of exercise that that could be the pleasure of the board to actually have a work session in that format um, and um, I, you know I'm, I'm big on format and settings and so forth a lot of times you know may, maybe even this boardroom maybe not the best conducive to, to do that you know in work sessions a lot of times we, we use b75 and other we're around the table and we're really um, like mr. Tatum mentioned that that previous year I, I remember that I think we uh, entitled it um, Jackie Wagner in the finance office years ago I think came up with that and part of that won a VACO award uh, several years ago we called it the budget balancing game and we actually and it's really we had macros and everything built in so it, it could be a very helpful exercise <clears throat> so I guess I'm saying you know that's certainly the pleasure of the board we can formally but I would say informally certainly if there's consensus we will during our budget process work through this to how do we want the budget process to go and we can work this in mm -hmm. I guess my question for mr. Quinn would are you okay with a consensus agreement on this or do you want to make that a formal motion I, I don't really know what's I don't know the process that well to say one's better than the other <laughs> I, I think consensus and it'll be in the minutes okay. Okay. as a consensus vote um, uh, and up. if there's opposition we would want to note that opposition yeah. I'm seeing a lot of heads nodding so I think is that okay with yeah you? That that's good on it. all right proposal number three okay the third is that the county would perform analytics <coughs> on the budget data and share those analytics with the Board of Supervisors. And so as I think back to the process we followed this year, um, the county was incredibly transparent. We got, I, I call it the 100-page three-ring binder where every dollar that is being spent was in there. But we really did not get analytics to help us understand the budget. And, uh, and to me, analytics, I, I tried to provide an example here, but it would be a variance analysis. And so when I look at the proposed budget this year over last year, it went up 13 million, the proposed, um, and that's total capital and expense. And, and we would be shown what makes up that 13 million. What are the big pieces of it? So for, I'll just, and I made up the example here, but let's say there's 5 million of it is capital. And well, 1 million is a fire truck and 2 million are for ambulances. And, and, and maybe, a poor, maybe the budget went down in a certain place by a lot of money and, and we would see that too. But that, that idea of having a variance analysis, and in my mind, it's one page. It's a summary of, of the major addition, additions and deletions from the budget over the prior year. And it really helps give you a roadmap for, for where you want to look as a supervisor. And I think there's, there are supervisors here that went through and did all that work on their own. But it would be much more efficient if the county provided that one page to us as a roadmap for where we want to look in the budget. And so the, that's a little bit of explanation about this variance analysis. Questions or comments? How much extra work are we talking about? That, yeah, that was going to be a question for Mr. Carter. <laughs> well, I, I guess, <clears throat> again, I think it depends on what the board would like to see. I mean, some of what the analysis is in there, you know, we have the budget message, that's the first pages, and then we also provide a lot of that in PowerPoint presentations, whether before or subsequent. Maybe that's maybe not the format that works best for the board, so that feedback's going to be very helpful for us. Um, you know, but we do provide the overall big ticket items. You know, Mr. Whitlow's presentation has some of that in it when he proposes to the <coughs> board uh, the budget every year. So I think it's just going to matter of what 
what ultimately, in addition to what we've done historically, the board wants to see from an analysis standpoint, especially, you know, if it's a one pager type item, I mean, staff already has that. We're always trying to figure out how do we present this to the board so it doesn't overwhelm you with all of the detail and it makes sense and it's something that's helpful. So it, it really wouldn't be a lot of extra work. Um, but then, you know, format wise, maybe we just retool and provide that instead of putting it in a PowerPoint presentation because a lot of that analysis, in my opinion, was in there, but it was probably not in a one page or so. I think it depends how the board wants to absorb that information. But extra work, I don't know that it'd be extra, it's just retooling what we already do. Okay. The other, um, the other comment I'd add to it, when I think about the summary data that we got, we got good, really good summary data by department, right? That was very clear. And so you could see the plus, you could see how much each department went up. But that doesn't show you certain things that are going on um, kind of uh, under the covers. For example, we don't know for counting the, the uh, compensation increase for the year. That was across all departments. So in the, in the, um, the breakdown by department, we could see, okay, each department went up by so much, but we didn't see, oh, you know, the, the amount of uh, compensation increase for all employees was this much money, right? And, and so I don't see us, uh, I really see this being le less than a page. It's, it's the really big ticket items that go into that, in this case, 13 million. What makes up that 13 million? That's at a summary level. And it, so ignore the departments. And so uh, personally, I, don't, I, I would work with the county on helping them with this because I, I don't see it as a lot of additional work. I think you have all the data right there at hand and it's just it's formatting one page that would help all of us do a better job of review that generate any questions from anyone again I think this is something uh, that we could probably just by consensus if, if everyone is comfortable with just trying it and see and and maybe mr. Quinn can uh, help out and get to that process and, and just let you know up front what he's thinking on it and we we'll try it and see. That'd be great. Everybody good with that? All right, I see you had nodding. So proposal number four. On to number four. So yeah. so this isn't part of the, it is not a process change as the first three were, but um, it occurred to me that the, there's not a pot of money, or I actually, I don't know of a pot of money where a supervisor can pay for small expenditures. And the, the one thing that I learned about that triggered this was uh, in the, the trail that was being made at Level Loop where we used the inmates to build the trail. And, and Reba Dillon was paying the inmates out of her own pocket for breakfast and lunch. And I thought, wow, that, that it's, it's already hard enough that we, the county, can't supply labor to do this. We're using inmates. And now we, we can't pay the inmates. We're some, a, a citizen's paying them out of their own pocket. And, it, and so I, I th it just occurred to me that there could be expenditures along the way like that. And it would be nice for us to be able to go to the county and to ask for that expenditure. And there'd have to be some kind of process put in place so the county could say, yes, this is a justifiable expenditure or not. So there couldn't be willy nilly spending, but it just seemed like we needed a pot of money to help with, it's almost a petty cash fund to pay for things like this. And so, so that was the idea around this one. Okay. And, and I put 25,000, I don't know, maybe 5,000, maybe it's some amount of money. And maybe it's a pot that, that's not by supervisor, but it's for all the supervisors. But it's, it's a pot of money that could pay for things like this. That to me, this is an embarrassing expense that a citizen's making on behalf of us to bring a service to the county. Does that generate any questions, comments? Go ahead. Just a quick comment. I think we have a fund in place already, the supervisor's discretionary fund, and, and I'm pretty satisfied with how that works. And like Miss Dillon is an example, uh, Dan could have requested us to pull money out of that to reimburse her for what she spent on that. Uh, me personally, I don't want $25,000 of taxpayers' money to go out here and fan around in the neighborhood because I may give it to 
25 organizations and then I got 150 over here on the side that are mad at me why didn't I get a thousand dollars or whatever it is that that's just me personally uh, I don't think uh, I think having the supervisors discretionary fund that we can use and Dan may not have been aware of that but there is a pot of money that we can as a board vote on to 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 dispense like that mm -hmm. so f for a situation like this would I bring this to the board that we want to pay for a lunch and breakfast is that how that I, I'm trying to learn how that would work using this as a case study how would how would we fund lunch and breakfast for inmates or, or maybe we wouldn't maybe we don't think we should Well, one thing when it comes to inmates, I think we're already feeding them. I was going to say we already feed them. Yeah, their, their meals should be provided uh, from the jail. Uh, I mean, that's required by law. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they have to have their, their meals provided. But in a case that, you know, where in this project where Miss Dillon, uh, you know, I guess purchased biscuits or whatever for breakfast uh, for them, uh, you know, if, if that's something that she did and she brings it to your attention, and you feel that that's something that that you would like to see a reimburse for i think you just bring it for the board and, and we can approve the the expenditure and, and do, you know do it that way rather than I, I have to agree with mr carter on setting up a, a pot of money for each individual supervisor i think that just lends to some headaches that we don't want to get into but there's there is money available but you know just when you see the need, just bring it before the board, and, and if it's board approved, you know that money is set aside. So no, I'm satisfied with that as a solution. You have a comment? I was just going to say, Mr. Chair, we might follow the same procedure we do with um, sign offs on expense reports, mm -hmm. which is submission and then approval by the board chair uh, and or vice chair. Um, if the board, you know, wants to vest that continued authority. Um, in the chair to approve that, that those types of expenses. I think That's if, an alternative. Yeah, if we did, I would want to see a, a, a certain limit. Sure. Put, a, this put just on an idea. It. Yeah, you know. But uh, what's, what's your thoughts? Would that generate any questions or comments from anyone else? This one's a no for me. Okay. <laughs> Everybody's real quiet about it. I'm all right with it, uh, the chair. I like that. We can set some limits to it. But I, I agree with Mr. Carter. I, I think each, we don't want to go down that rabbit hole putting money in, in the supervisor's pockets. To I think, you know, rabbit we, hole we don't want to go down. Yeah. I think we have a procedure in, in place. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if in this particular case, if, if Ms. Dillon, uh, if you were aware, and, and I know I hate to keep calling, she's not going to ask for it. I can tell you right right up front. Mm -hmm. But if you're aware of it and you want to offer that to her, then I, I think you can bring it forward. Mm -hmm. And you know the money is is identified in in this case. So uh, okay, all right, done. Thanks. Okay, all right. Moving right along, we have an ambulance purchase order that we need to make, and I'm going to let. Uh, Mr. Whitlow, explain this one. Sure, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the board. I mentioned on Tuesday at Tuesday's meeting that uh, currently our public safety fleet, our EMS trucks, we're just having a round of mechanical issues and uh, the aging fleet and so forth. And I guess uh, the good news is um, uh, in the approved budget, uh, in the in the year's budget that was recently adopted and approved, we have budgeted. Uh, for a couple of ambulances. Um, of course, they really need to be ordered um, uh, in, in terms of the time frame to get those delivered. It's, it's about a year away before they could be delivered. Um, one was specifically budgeted in the budget. The other, if the board will recall, uh, uh, with the um, solar project agreement, when those funds come in, it will be allocated to purchase uh, an ambulance um, specifically and so Steve Sandy um, has worked with our public safety chief director Mike Fowler who's uh, with us today if there are any questions but it's, it's fairly straightforward the money um, uh, is already appropriated in the budget of course the solar funds have not been appropriated yet because they have not come in yet so in the event that they didn't come in we would we would have to look at reserve or next year's budget so I have a, an executive summary. This was a time-sensitive issue. Mr. Chairman, again, this is not a change to the budget. 
uh, it's just a matter of ordering, if you will, um, the, the, the ambulances. And um, Mr. Sandy uh, is here, I'm sure, can answer any questions as, as well as um, uh, Chief Fowler. In addition to uh, these two ambulances, I think I mentioned Tuesday that we'll be coming back at the August meeting. Look forward to a discussion on our capital facilities and fleet where we have a more recurrence. We know we replace EMS trucks continually uh, and we'll need to do so on a regular basis. And so Mr. Carter and I are meeting with Mr. Rose next week to talk about some strategies on how to go about that in a more systematic fashion. But uh, for the here and now, we, we know we have two uh, ambulances. But, um, before the board, and we may talk about uh, a couple of more as we get into more work sessions in the next couple of months. But uh, Mr. Sandy's here if there are any questions, Mr. Chairman. Anyone have any questions for Mr. Sandy? Um, Mr. Sandy, uh, are ambulances in the rotation schedule for our fire apparatus? Or They're not in that apparatus schedule that you've seen before. That's just the fire side. So do we have any guiding document on ambulance? We do. We have a. Um, guideline there in your in that first paragraph in the discussion i'm sorry our, i just the first time I've seen i know this. yeah so uh, in there it, it talks about uh, really the the parameter we have is 125,000 miles for for those so we already have one that exceeds that and by the time we get to next year when we actually get uh the both of these units we'll probably have two two to three more that'll be over that that limit i'm looking back to chief fowler but uh, to your question specifically and, and to Chris's comments is that's something that Chief Fowler is, is currently working on to develop that rotation plan and schedule for those out years. Um, because again, because of time frames, and you guys have heard this a hundred times, you know, the, the wait times is that, you know, trying to make sure we're scheduling those out and then being able to place those orders ahead of time. Uh, for these as well, we're, we're we're not going to pay for these until they actually come in. And, and so uh, to Chris's point, we anticipate that solar money will be here prior to that. Uh, what we're looking for today is just the, the permission to go ahead and order these. These units are identified as Braun um, Type 1, Braun Chief XL. Um, there was an internal uh, staff committee that reviewed seven different manufacturers, um, and this was the recommendation uh, from that committee as well as uh, one of the other key points Chief Fowler was telling me is that there's a certified warranty shop for this brand in the county, which mm -hmm. is a huge, uh, that's one of the issues we're having now with some of them uh, that have warranty issues. They have to go go away to be worked on and, and then that time frame sometimes can be extensive for us to get that vehicle back. And so I think that was another big plus to have a certified um, shop right here in the county uh, for these. And then the, these are being purchased off of a contract. Um, so uh, one of the procurement contracts, uh, same contract, I think we bought the last couple of fire trucks as well. Mr. Chair, Go ahead. Mr. Sandy, um, does this include the upfit costs, the stretcher, the med cabinets, all this stuff? I learned my lesson with the fire trucks. Um, you kind of just get bare bones and then you have to order the stuff, if you will. Correct. So it's so a good question. There, there is an optional uh, power load, I think, that uh, is, was part of the quote for this one. That is, uh, I think, what rather than buy that directly from the manufacturer, we're looking that we would purchase that separately and have the manufacturer install it at the time the truck is completed. So, so there would be that additional equipment expense that for, for that unit. Now, as far as some of the other specifics, I would have to defer to Chief Fowler on that as far as what other things might have to be added later on. Hi, Mike. Somebody. Good afternoon. Uh, yeah, so talking about these and, and specifically why we chose these a uh, couple of things, um, I've always promised uh, you guys in some of the private meetings in, in here, uh, I will be fiscally responsible with the budget as well. Uh, so what we did is uh, we, we trying to take out the customization um, factor in this. And Braun has developed a new program that under this contract we're looking to jump into, which will help um, as we come forward in, in the future with data um, showing on a recurrence plan. So the benefit to jumping into this plan now <clears throat> and getting on the ground floor with Braun 
is instead of a three-year build, um, which is typical for uh, specialized pieces, that we, we will agree to limit what we want to do with customization and any of those upfittings. Um, again, our basic needs are the diesel engine, uh, the four-wheel drive based on our terrain. We can manage with the, with the current configuration that they have. Some of the packages that were offered in here we're, we're meeting the needs that we would have potentially upfitted with. So uh, with this and, and jumping into the contract, that's why we were able to get ahead of the curve and get those ambulances as early as uh, August of next year. Um, and then we, were, we would be billing out with Braun on what that would look like uh, as a recurrent and, and getting those this fleet properly replaced um, versus coming to you. So the only reason why we're asking to spend that money is again, we have that, we're, we're very, very close, um, yeah. even without the solar money to the current budget that you guys have given us. Um, and that's always been my goal is to just put that there. Now, as far as the power loads go, um, that is something we're currently using in all of our ambulances. And so there is an upfit um, in totality of about $38,000 if we allow Braun to do it. Uh, and speaking with Chance Kimball, the rep from PennCare and our committee, we can probably shave several thousand off that by um, dealing with Stryker directly and then having those added in. Um, so they're, they're, what you have in front of you does show the current price for the two medics uh, in addition to what those power loads would be. But we would say that we would we would prefer to do those in a separate purchase just to bring some of that that cost savings down. But the rest of the upfitting, uh, we don't have any intention to do that with these units because again, the the goal would be to just start getting a hold on on a consistent fleet um, that is less customizable and more fiscally responsible. Thanks, Mike. I applaud this advocacy. This is a big need we have. All right. Thank you. Anyone else? All right, board, what's your pleasure? Mr. Chair, I'm pre prepared to provide a motion unless the board has suggestions. Go ahead. I make a motion to approve the order of two Braun Type 1 ambulances from PennCare Inc. utilizing the Houston Galveston Area Council Cooperative Purchasing Program known as HGAC BY in the amount of $749,990 <coughs> and authorize staff to execute the necessary contract documents. Payment will be made upon delivery and will utilize funding allocated in the public safety EMS vehicle replacement capital account. Okay. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion before we take a final vote? Madam Clerk, will you take a roll call, please? Supervisor Mitchell? Yes. Supervisor Carter? Yes. Supervisor Smith? Yes. Supervisor Quinn? Yes. Supervisor Jamison? Yes. Um, Vice Chair Tatum? Yes. And Chairman Thompson is absent for the vote. All right, moving right along. Mr. Chapman, Smith Farm update. Good to see you today. Yeah. <laughs> My airmen, members of the board. Yeah, good to see you. Thank you all very much for having me this afternoon. Um, cheer with you guys. Um, some updates about the Smith Farm. Let's see, some of you all are um, have been here a while and know a lot about the Smith Farm, and some of you are maybe a little bit newer and not quite aware. So I'll kind of give a, some, uh, a bit of a background on the park or on the property, and uh, but feel free to, uh, after um, I kind of go through all this, to hit me put any questions. But I'll lead into uh, current um, actions going on out there. Okay, so, so a bit of the background. This goes back to um, 2010 when the county purchased uh, the property from Virginia Western Community College for a million dollars. And um, that was, uh, it was paid off with $100,000 a year for 10 years. And the great deal about that was is that all that went towards um, scholarships for uh, Frank County students to attend Virginia Western. So it's a great program. I think that was very, very well received from things that I've heard. Um, the property uh, is 395 acres and it's zoned A1 and um, there are restrictions on the property. I guess one of the, when it was purchased from Virginia Western, um, the purchase agreement said purchaser does not intend to sell or otherwise transfer the property, but the purchaser intends to use the property for public education, conservation, public purposes consistent with the existing restrict restrictive covenants which applies to the property. 
And I guess too, I want to stress that this, the Smith Farm is very unique. It is um, one of the um, last large parcels of property. It's on the water. It has mature hardwoods. It has neat historical um, properties there and um, strong community connections. So it is definitely unique. There's been a lot of planning. So anything we've done here is it's been looked at a lot. Um, going back way before the county owns it, there's some plans done in 2005 that Virginia Western um, did. I've looked at those, I've um, dusted those off, and it was very grandiose. It had um, things like a conference center and equestrian facility that was really large, houses, condos, and a, a very um, a, a big, large marina. And so this, of course, going back to 2005 before the county purchased it. Of course, the county purchased it in 2010, and I think that the county has gone probably more in the direction that the community would like to see. The county really raised the value of um, the rural area and wanted to um, you know, observe that the, um, the wishes of the Smith family and, um, and really saw the value of the conservation efforts there especially the stream credits there. So in 2016, uh, the, um, you all, the board decided to pursue looking at stream and nutrient credits there at the place on the property. And these are always and forever. So one of the big um, driving things was the board and staff did not want to preserve and protect something that if there was some value in it is for recreation later, especially if there might be something where there might be uh, preserving one section and it might landlock us from getting to another section. So it might not be smart. You might want to allow like uh, an easement through that area. So we want to be smart about it. So that in 2016, a uh, conceptual master plan was done um, to look at that. And it was just a conceptual plan, but identified the driving factors where it wanted to identify areas for development, wanted to preserve the agricultural area, meet the recreational needs of the community. And it really focused on infrastructure at that time that could be done with um, you know, grants and nonprofit donations and that kind of thing. At that time, and back in 2016, the big driving force was things like Explore Park. There was a big private, um, public-private partnership, and we knew the county did not have lots of money just to develop the place. So that was a driving factor. So this is a uh, an image of the Smith Farm, and this is actually the most recent uh, conservation easement um, boundaries. The dotted lines there are the um, the boundaries of what would be preserved and those blue lines of course are the streams that are on the site so if you look at it, it's about 162 acres and about 41 percent of the property so a pretty significant portion so going back to 2016 so at 2016 um, uh, this was the plan that was put into place and it's such a large property it's really hard to read that so let me zoom in on some things and actually these are the exact same photographs and slides that I, I pulled from the 2016 presentation. So I didn't want to change too much and give you all kind of the vision of things at that point. So back in 2016, the idea was to create a special event area and I call it special event areas. Really, it was preserving that um, historic farmhouse that's there. There's a really neat pre-Civil War era farm home that's there and the barn beneath it. It was the idea was to turn it into like a um, like a wedding type venue, a special event type area. And these are the photographs that were shared during that time. The other area that was being considered was an equestrian facilities. In 2016, there was a very active equestrian group, and they were looking actually at building a, a riding ring somewhere in the county. They were kind of looking at different spots and that kind of thing. And so one of the places they were um, considering. Um, building this was at Smith Farm. So the idea was to put in a, um, a facility out there that would be for tournaments and our shows and that kind of thing. These are some of the images, riding rings and special event area for these um, equestrian shows throughout the year. Uh, another component was a waterfront area. And this was, as you all know, one of the biggest needs um, in the county and biggest demands is um, access to water and as big as Smelt Lake is there's very limited access to water and this would um, help meet those needs. Um, the Smith Farm is unlike uh, the Smelt Lake Community Park where it's on the main channel and it's just a different beast. Here it's up on the upper portion of the black water of course. It's tucked in kind of a neighborhood so you couldn't quite do the same things there. So the plans at this time called for um, 
definitely no like motorized boat access or launches, that kind of thing. But for areas where people would be able to launch canoes and kayaks, passive recreation, a fishing pier, and probably the most um, interesting one at the time was a, this is a cable park. Essentially, it's a these are not, these are quiet, but it's kind of the best of both worlds. It's quiet. It gives people the um, the experience of water skiing behind a boat, but these are quiet with uh, minimal impact. And uh, that was the idea. Actually, since this time, a um, the Blackwater Junction, if you all know, probably aware of that, has actually opened up since this time. So even that's somewhat changed. Uh, the next one was a campground um, in Yurt Rentals, and it had you know RV camping and tent camping. Um, so you know, a number of things. But so what? So since 2016, that's um, it's been a while, but not that long. It's mostly uh, there's been a lot of time spent developing these stream credits, um, but back in um, just back in um, 22, the um, you all approved the um, construction of the Lovely Valley Loop. In fact, you all were talking about it just a little bit ago, and it was opened up earlier this spring. And I have it's just been a huge success. People have loved it, and I've heard nothing but compliments. Big hit. Many of you all were there for the grand opening. Been a great plan, and that was actually part of the in that plan. We almost followed that those conceptual plans almost to the to the dot. It was perfect. Um, but there's been some but some changes, some things. Um, as soon as you do a plan, of course, things change. And so conservation boundaries, those ones I shared with you earlier, are slightly different than the ones in 2016. Civic organizations like the Equestrian Club isn't active like they used to be. Recreational demands have changed. Um, we weren't talking about many of the things we're talking about now about as far as recreational needs and like the, like the um, we're talking about Blackwater Junction and the cable park that came out that wasn't around. And to be honest, there's been a lot of increased interest. People have like, I've been hearing a lot of, wouldn't it be great if you did this, the Smith Farm? We've heard a lot of those things. And I love, of course, I'm the recreation guy. I love hearing things and I'm like, yeah, let's do it. That's usually my, my default mode. Um, but just popping in things sometimes does make me a little bit nervous because that might interfere with something some like that might be a great idea but it might be better someplace else so i'd i almost be i kind of like things planned out and thought out and so i don't like just um you know it has to be well thought out if you're doing things that aren't necessarily in the plan so we um the staff and the recreation advisor commission um we said gosh there's always things I'm like let's let's revisit this this is time to to look at this um, master plan again so very um similar goals um, as 2016. Um, and of course, all of these said there's, um, whenever you talk about plans and developing recreation um, or making any kind of changes, people, some, some, that makes some people a little bit nervous, but this does not mean that just anything goes. There's all kinds of restraints and constraints that are on this property. It's A1 zoned. There's, you know, there's deed restrictions. There's things in the will and testament. Um, all these kind of regulations of AEP, Army Corps, Every acronym you can think of is going to weigh in on this. AEP, Army Corps, and you know VDOT. We want to and we want to be good stewards with um, the neighbors there. So this would not mean that just anything goes. So the process that's um, we've been undertaking is um, back in April we started um, working with Hill Studio. They've um, put, to start you know getting site maps up to date. Um, we started a, a couple um, public engagement. Um, groups and we launched a survey back in 2018. In fact, we did that with the, um, as you all were there at the ribbon cutting for the Lovely Valley Loop, we said, you know what, we're doing this online survey and we encourage people to, to weigh in. We, have, we wanna hear people and get their input. Um, we had a couple meetings with different groups during the month of May. In fact, there's a very large group with uh, some neighborhoods back in um, the, towards the end of May on May 21st. Um, and so that brings us to, to now. We're, we're uh, working with Hill Studio to prepare three conceptual plans, and we'll work that through the Recreation Advisory Commission, but we're hoping to present those to the public in August. And in October, our plan is to bring those back to you all to um, get your opinion on um, which of these plans to go forward with, and, um, and then after that, hope to implement and keep moving forward. So you may be interested, the survey results. These are up to date. In fact, we've been taking it offline and haven't been promoting as much, but it's actually still active today. But as of a couple days ago, we had 242 um, responses. And that's since April 12th. I think that's really good. I was like, if we get 100 responses, 
I'll be happy with that. Um, but it definitely um, caught people's attention. So we had a number of survey responses. And I guess I want to um, share with you this. 242 is a great number. It's, it's a very impressive number to share. And I'm going to go over some of the results from that here in a second. But I looked up the, st st the statistically significant number that you would need and it's actually 382 so we're still pretty much shy so i guess i don't like don't take this as oh if the survey says it it must be fact i would but it's a good it's a good reference point and a good place to um get some input um the input that we had there's some demographic questions on there um we had one of the questions was uh proximity to the park it was heavily weighted towards um, people that live nearby, which of course would make sense. Those people that be most vested and interested in. But we, it was really good. We had a good, I thought we might have um, leaning one way on like economic, um, what, where they were socioeconomically, and we had a good diversity there. Um, so anyway, uh, good demographic information. So this, this is what folks said. Like one of the questions, I try to summarize this up just in a couple of slides so far, like what activities should Smith Farm Park offer? And I uh, did these in descending order. So, you know, most people said enjoy nature, simple relaxation, spend time with friends, exercise and fitness, and it kind of tapered off from there from special events, individual sports, and organized sports. We kind of we kind of knew that. That's kind of what the, the original uh, conceptual plan said. So that, that was good to see that it kind of confirmed most of those things. The question is, what items from the 2016 plan would you like to see remain? And so in descending order, you know, hiking and biking trails, I think that's probably scored so high because of the recent success we just had with the Lovely Valley Loop. But yep, um, access to water, canoe and kayak launch, and fishing pier, uh, special event venue, and it kind of tapered on from there from campground, equestrian center, skeet shooting, and cable skiing. And then another question was, what items would you like to be added? Um, a lot of people said picnic shelters, uh, playgrounds, fitness trail, outdoor gym, community garden, dog park, and it kind of tapered down from the air from you know cabins, pickleball courts, disc golf, athletic fields, and other. We had a num we had the widest variety of other um, everything from sports complexes to uh, you name it. It was in, it was on other. So lots of there was no um, similarity within the other responses, but um, but good information there. So again. Where we are right now, we're really just wrapping up the survey. We're working with Hill Studio. In fact, we're meeting um, some Recreation Advisory Commission um, representatives and some staff members are meeting with Hill Studio on Monday afternoon. And um, so we're well on our way to have some conceptual plans ready to review with the RAC and hopefully present to the public in August. Um, that is really kind of where we are going on there now. I guess I, one other thing I want to share, um, I know many of y'all heard that like the, there was definitely some, um, I want to be fully transparent about this whole process. And I'm not a, I realize this as I'm wrapping things up, I might have glossed over one part, portion of it, is definitely when I when presented this to like the, neighbor, the local um, neighborhood, there was definitely some vocal people that were concerned. And I think they'd seen some developments in other areas nearby, and there was definitely some apprehension and concerns that this would negatively affect them. So there's a, um, and I guess I wasn't quite prepared for that. Usually people are dying for parks in their neighborhood, but like, so I was a little bit uh, like um, shocked to see that kind of thing. Or and there's always some people that are, you know, have concerns. And, and I, they had, there are some really good, um, you know, comments and concerns. And I guess many of those concerns, I think, that they had for like traffic was a big thing, um, noise, proximity, that kind of thing, they like the quiet and the solitude of it. I think many of those things could be addressed as, you know, as these plans are being done. So I guess I wanted to say is those, um, and you all, I'm sure I've heard some of these, um, um, you know, with the public, is you all are well in tune with the public, is that the um, Recreation Advisory Commission staff Hill Studio, we share with them the survey results is going far and we're trying to implement those things to be, you know, to balance both the community need and also being respective of the time. I don't think there's anybody that joins one of our parks right now that doesn't love being next to a park. And I guess I've been in the parks and recreation career for decades now. And that's, you know, that's generally the, the what happens is people, you know, have apprehensions, which I would, if it was, I would, I would want to make sure it's good quality, but you know, over time people like, you know, tend to lo um, love the new recreational amenities going in the neighborhood. So that's the, um, the Smith Farm um, update. 
I'd just open up to see if you, have, you might have any questions I might help right. out with. Anyone have any questions for Mr. Chapman? Go ahead, Mark. I'll just have a, uh, maybe a comment. Can you go back a couple slides, Paul? Yes, sir. Um, Porch, one, yeah, right there. Okay. When you all come back to the board, uh, I would like to see, say, for example, picnic shelter, what that's going to cost, what the statistics are, how much it's going to be used, uh, some, some demographics on some of these things before, just speaking for myself, we, we vote on what we're going to do out there. I would like to see if it's an item that's going to be used a lot, what it's going to cost, what the maintenance is going to be on it long term, some of those factors uh, moving forward before we start making decisions about what we're going to put in the park. Mr. Carter, um, I, I completely agree. One of the things that we have with the agreement with Hill Studio is not just to give us some pretty pictures, but to give us some costs associated with those things. So we can't, yeah, we can have a dollar amount, something to look forward to. And so we can look at that our, that return on investment to see if it's worthwhile. But yeah, that's definitely part of the agreement with Hill Studio. And you all probably know a percentage of how many people are going to play pickleball there, how many people are going to use disc, disc golf or, or that sort of thing. I don't want to put things in that park and, and pay for it that aren't going to be utilized. Absolutely, yeah. Smith Farm is definitely unique. It's a little bit off the beaten path. You have, you have to drive there a little bit. So, yeah, yeah it's not um, – it wouldn't be a great spot necessarily for an athletic complex because it's so far down the road. But, yeah, we can – for sure. Thank you. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Paul, thank you so much for briefing us on the Smith Farm. Um, I just want to go on record with my colleagues. I have been kind of pushing Smith Farm master plan redevelopment, if you will, since I came on the board in 2020. And um, I know this is in Mr. Quinn's district, uh, but when I think of the Smith Farm, I think of this as a wonderful Franklin County asset. Um, I, I think it is. it could be developed responsive to the things that Paul is aware of um, in your professional uh, opinion, Paul, that are what people want to see these days. And I think we have a tremendous opportunity uh, to utilize that waterfront uh, for things that citizens in Franklin County may not otherwise have access to. You can go over to the Smith Mountain Lake Park and have that swimming area. Um, but if we were able to do some different things over there, I think it just really continues to enhance our economic development value and our asset package for the county. Um, Mike, the other comment I'd make, and I think this would be helpful for everybody to, to think about, is that I, I see us approving a plan, but that's not necessarily approving expenditures to the plan. And so th there can be a master plan, and then we would end up voting on pieces of the plan and deciding whether we would approve pieces of the plan. The other thing that I see coming out of this is that it's not necessarily all county funding. There, there are other funding sources. There could be grants, and and uh, and Reba and her team have demonstrated the ability to to actually raise money. And so, some of these, I'll pick a really expensive one, like a, a, the ski shooting. Right, it, it would have to be indoors. It's it's probably a multi million dollar facility. You, you could include that in the plan. There's no way the county would ever pay for that, but you might end up with a donor that was willing to fund something like that, and then it becomes very interesting. You have a placeholder for it in the plan, it's a lot of money, and all of a sudden there's mana from heaven to pay for it. So uh, anyway, just I thought it was interesting to separate the, the plan and, and approving a plan that has lots of things in there from um, the budget to actually make that plan a reality. Any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Chapman. All right, excellent. Thank you all for your time. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you and your staff for their hard work. Ms. Dillon. An update on the dog park. And if you would be so kind, if you could give us an update on the Bill, disc golf as well. Before I start, I want to make one comment. Okay. I want to thank you all for voting for the firm group. I feel like they'll make you proud. Um, and you know that I will be 100% behind the Smith Farm. The other comment I want to make, Mr. Quinn, I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Um, 
for thinking of me. <laughs> but if you all remember back in 2010, most of you all were not on the board at that time, but some of you were. But if you remember when we built the uh, public beach. Excuse me. Could, could you speak in the microphone? My voice cracks because I only have part of a voice box. And I kind of don't like to speak into a microphone because it makes my voice even sound worse. And with only one lung, it's really bad. <laughs> so I hope you all can hear me. Good. We can hear you. And because uh, it really is embarrassing to hear myself after knowing what my voice used to be. But in 2010, when we wanted to build the community park and there was no money, and uh, I said, it will happen. And at that time, uh, my husband and I stepped forward and we put the money for the fish and pier, the shelter, um, and the county bought the material and we furnished all the labor and all of the equipment. Mm -hmm. That costed me about $50,000 out of my pocket. I, the part, the hiking trail, I paid for everything plus all the workers' meals every day. And that costed me, I spent about $75,000 total. There's never a day that I will ask you off to refund one penny. I give it to you from the goodness of my heart. My husband says I give away everything we got, <laughs> but that's okay. Now, let's get down to business. Uh, Paul, would you hand this? There is a copy of these for you all. And if you will, please take one of each one of them. And so that this is something I want you all to have handy. Okay, we're on the dog park. The dog park, I put together a criteria for it. And, uh, but before I make my speech, I really want you all to hear from my wonderful board. And the first person that's gonna come forward is the attorney for us, which is Tim Burton. Good afternoon, everyone. Good How afternoon. Are you all? My name's Tim Bird. I'm with Keystone Legal. Um, Reba asked me to come and basically talk to you a little bit about the park, mostly about how the park would probably operate, because I think there's some concerns about that. The park would be like many other parks. It's kind of a self-serve park, but it's a specialized self-serve park in the sense that it would cater to dogs and other animals, but it would be something where people would go to. Now, what's important about that is, is that we're very cognizant that we want the park to be a wonderful, enjoyable place, so we would put rules in place. General rules that so when a patron went to the park, the patron would know what the to expect and what they did. And there's lots and lots of sets of these rules out there. I think in your packet, you have some rules. And, and those are just examples of the kinds of things that we would want to be put in place to make sure that anybody who was using the park would be comfortable when they got there. They would know what to expect. They would know what to expect that their behavior should be. They would know how to expect the other patrons' behavior would be to make it a really wonderful, enjoyable experience. The rules could be simple. The rules could be complex. It's whatever makes the board comfortable in knowing that this park is going to be actually a gem of the county as opposed to anything else. And so that would be something that certainly we could work with with the board or work with, I could work with Mr. Gwynn, I know him quite well, and, and get that down to where the, the rules of how the park was going to operate would be something that the county would be no, to have zero concern about and have con uh, things. And that really is what we were talking about as far as it goes. Um, that was what they asked me mostly to speak about, is to ensure that the county would be understand that this is a park that mostly takes and it works in a way that would make sure everybody who uses is comfortable and work. We're basically looking at a situation where it would be a part of the county where, unfortunately, it really doesn't have the people that live in that part of the county don't have the access to the facilities like we do in some other parts, like where you can go to Wade Park, for example, and have a lot of facilities to use with your dogs. That's much, much more difficult in the Westlake area only because of the population density, the building density, the housing density, and it's a much more difficult position for those kinds of people to do. And so that's why we were looking at hooking the park, probably if likely, over in that part of the county or in that location, because it would just serve the county's needs so much more uh, effectively. Certainly, anybody anywhere can come use it. It would be wonderful have part, people from other parts of the county come down. We love to see everybody from every part of the county. But I think when you look at how the county demographics and population goes, it looks like it fits 
fits a whole lot better in that area because we want the people there to have the opportunity to enjoy their dogs and have the dogs have a wonderful and durable opportunity just like everywhere else. And so really what Reba asked me to speak to was the kind of saying is, do we have any concerns about the dog park going in from a county concern? No, it's basically a park. It's like any other park. The county wouldn't have any further or any other bigger liability concerns than they would with any other park that exists now. It would just give the county the opportunity to have dogs and everybody else and the wonderful citizens of our county uh, have a good time as well. So it really doesn't add any kind of concerns or any kind of problems that any other park that exists in the county has. It really would do that. It would just be a somewhat of a unique purpose park where other parks, you can do similar things, but this one is designed to make sure all of our people in that part of the county have access to these facilities. Does anybody have any questions for me on this part? We don't have any questions. No. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Thank, thank you. you. The next one I have is Terry Stanley. Terry Parenti. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, we changed that a while ago. <laughs> Forget about it. She went through a divorce. Um, but she has done a survey in the... Um, and available. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, I think she, So I'm going to okay. let her speak. Yeah. My, hi, my name is Terry Parenti. Um, I am a resident at Westlake. I've actually lived in Westlake over 20 years. I raised my son there. Um, had a lot of fun experiences. I uh, built my house, sold my house, moved into a town home so I feel like I know the Westlake area pretty good um, so what I thought I would do is kind of just give you kind of maybe a Terry's uh, dog park due diligence data real quick just to kind of give you some updates um, things that I've noticed um, that I gathered some information um, we've noticed that um, I, I went to VDOT first and asked about the vehicles that go across, that uh, travel on the Westlake area. Um, it sounds like what they pointed out was it was over uh, 14,000 vehicles a day from the, I guess you would call it the uh, Kroger area, on down to the bridge, and actually even more, over 16,000 vehicles a day that is at the Hardy Road intersection on over to Kroger. So there's a lot of activity. So we've got a, a lot of good uh, uh, people coming in and out of the area. Uh, things that I noticed that our recent really good uh, brick and mortar growth, we had the uh, Rock Outdoors come in that took the existing uh, old grand building and tripled the size. They are just booming right now. Uh, we have the uh, Ridgeview Bank that was uh, recently built, and we had the apartments at Westlake. Did you guys notice the apartments that are over behind CVS? Very interesting. We'll come back to that one, too, because that has a lot to do with, with our, our dogs. Um, we also had the recent uh, contract on the 500 acres that's right across from Lake Watch. We've heard some really fun things that excited about that um, also the one that I'm really excited about we've had Chick-fil-a come in and do their due diligence over at the uh, caps uh, parking lot I don't know if you guys know about that every Wednesday they come in and they're sold out every Wednesday and it ticks me off when I don't get there in time <laughs> um, but getting back to probably more of the dog bis uh, business in that area um, let's first talk about the uh, Westlake Apartments. There are 72, I talked to Jessica Anderson. She is the uh, manager and the leasing agent out there. There are four buildings that were being built. There's three out of the four that have been completed already. A total of 72 units, and out of the 72 units, 50 of them confirmed that they have pets. 50 out of 72 and they are all totally leased they have a wait list they're getting great rents they get over eleven hundred dollars for a one bedroom over thirteen hundred for a two bedroom and again a wait list and they said that one of the biggest attributes was that it is a dog friendly uh development um so that was a really big thing um, Barclays came in. That was so cute over at the Westlake Commons. Um, they, if you know, also know, they are also located at Rocky Mount. I talked to Hal Turner. He's the manager. And Jana, Jana actually works at both locations. And I asked them how 
as the activity. How's your, you know, uh, traffic that comes in and out? They say they are doing wonderfully. They actually have as much traffic at the Westlake location as they do at Rocky Mount. Uh, she did say that the dynamics are a little different, that our people at Westlake like to come in the morning and early afternoon, and uh, Rocky Mount's a little bit later in the afternoon, but she said that they're very pleased with, with their uh, business at that location. Um, we have Bark, Bath & Beyond. I, that is a grooming, dog grooming uh, business. That's right there again. Everything I'm talking about is right here at Westlake. Um, Erica is the owner. I went in and talked to her, and she goes, oh, my word. She goes, it's crazy. She says, I'm not accepting any more clients, no new clients, and she's booked out until November for dog grooming. So that's, you know, anybody wants to open up another business. <laughs> um, and speaking of Bark Avenue is another one that does dog grooming. They didn't quite open up as much to me as uh, the other one, but they said that they are very busy and they're looking to extend to move to a larger facility so that they can handle all the, the dog business that they have. Um, we have two vets right at Westlake. Dr. Luke said that, you know, he just, he's been there forever. They're, they're just wonderful. Um, that he actually hired another vet because he could not handle all of the activity in his, in his uh, uh, office. Uh, um, so he was talking about that he thinks, he just was like, oh, that would be fabulous if we could get a dog park. So he is really on board with it. But um, getting back to some of the places that really are in dire need of the dog parks, we'll go back to this Westlake uh, Apartments that uh, we've seen just the numbers show that it's, it was in well in high demand. Um, it was very well accepted. It's doing extremely well. Um, the manager did say that one of the uh, challenges that she has, she doesn't really want to call it a, uh, a problem, but a challenge is that there is no place to walk the dogs. If you know where it is, it's right behind CVS. It's on the corner of Moorwood and 122, and you are not going to walk a dog in that area. No way. And it's kind of cute. I go to uh, Bagel and I just about every morning, which is right back there, and you literally see the people walking their dogs in the parking lots that go around in the businesses. So you can see that they really do need a place to bring their dogs. Um, Westlake Point, where I live, it's 46 townhomes. Out of the 46, 20 are dog owners. Um, we are blessed in a way that we are in Chestnut Creek, so we do get to walk our dogs in other people's yards, you know, but we don't have sidewalks. We don't have places that we can actually go and walk our dogs, so. Um, and Bridgewater Point, which I think you're gonna talk about. Yeah, so I won't talk about that. Um, but getting to uh, the last thing, really about the dog park itself, where we would like to have it, if you know where it's that 15 acre parcel that y'all have, and it's right behind, well, you know where uh, Bojangles is. So you have Bojangles, you have a couple of, of vacant lots, and then you have the green, uh, the, the green space, or uh, well, what you call, um, I want to call it the right thing, not dump. Uh, it's the... Uh, the refuse site? You no, know, it's called manned green box site. I can't say that too many oh, times. Manned green... Dumpsters. Well, we call them dumpsters, yeah. <laughs> but um, so... If you notice, okay, so we have the dumpsters, and then you have the 15 acres, and I think a little bit of the dumpster is actually on the, uh, the that 15 acres, when if you look at the survey. Um, but as an appraiser, I'm a, by the way, I'm a real estate appraiser, uh, what is important is a good fit or a match for that particular area. And you have to ask yourself, what business actually wants to come in and be right beside the dump kind of thing? And so you do have those 15 acres, and I know you guys probably have some really great ideas of what to do with it, but how do you transition from the dumpster to whatever else you want to do for the 15 acres? And I think a dog park is a really nice transitional uh, facility kind of thing. You know, it's, it's a, a open air. I mean, it's a great place to right beside to take the poop kind of thing, and, you know, it, it, it would just transition right into it. Um, it's a great amenity that we don't have. We just don't have it here at, at in the Westlake area, even though nearby. So, and it shows that, that we do have a big demand for it. And um, a relief of any possible safety issues, like these people that do live in the apartments, that do live in the condos, that do live, and 
you're not going to not walk your dog. You're going to walk your dog. So it could lead to possible safety issues, and it'd just be a great thing to have. So that's about it. That's my Terry's yeah, dog park due diligence. <laughs> Do you have any questions? Any questions? Awesome. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you so much. And I might want to call me. She's the, uh, I'm the president. She's the vice president. Okay. <laughs> okay. The other person I would like for you to meet from my board is uh, Charlene Jones. She lives in the uh, town. Well, she lives at the bridge in the high rise apartments. Uh, thank you, Reba. Good afternoon. Again, my name is Charlene Jones, and I'm a realtor with Remax Lakefront Realty at Smith Mountain Lake, and I'm also a board member uh, for the Recreational Development of Franklin County. I've been a realtor for about 22 years, and um, I think pretty much every time I show property to a potential client, and basically most of my clients come from Northern Virginia, D.C., Maryland, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and you know they're used to a lot of amenities. And the first question they ask is, when they're looking for condos, townhomes, patio homes, do they allow dogs? How many dogs and the weight limit? Because people love their dogs as much almost as they do their children. And just like children, you know, they need to have a place that they can exercise, run around, because most of these pets, when they come down here for vacation, they're stuck in the condos and townhomes all day long. And then when they go outside, they have a small place to be walked, and they're on a leash. And they need a place to run, to go, you know, fetch balls. And, um, you know, having a, you know, Smith Mountain Lake is a resort area. And we just feel like that it's just really important to have a place for our part-time, full-time, and our vacationers to be able to bring their dogs to a location that's safe and, most of all, is convenient for our, our, um, our people. And, you know, the location uh, at Westlake, um, behind, beside the waste management facility, it's just a perfect place. It's very convenient and it's very safe and it's not close to any um, homes. Um, so it wouldn't bother you know, our homeowners in that community. And it's, it's most of the communities that would benefit the most would be Bernard's Landing, huge resort. And there's still not a lot of places for them to take pets. They usually just have a small area. You put them on a leash and you got to take them over there. So you have Bernard's Landing. You have Cambridge Court townhomes. You have the condos at the Rise. And you have Striper's Landing. You have the condos and townhomes at the waterfront. Uh, I live at Bridgewater Point. There's only a small section that you can take your dog out. And you don't see a lot of people walking around. They take them out and they run back inside. Um, so I know there's approximately 12 owners uh, in that um, community that has um, pets. Timber Lake Crossing is another one. And in addition to those, you know, people will come in and stay in the hotels and motels and apartments, Westlake um, Apartments, Lake Inn Motel, Westlake Waterfront Inn Apartments off of Blue Water Drive, 666 and Warwood Drive. You know, we just feel confident that if we had a dog park located at the um, Lake Watch Plantation community, that people will utilize that on a regular basis. And then you have all the people that live in the homes, like Reba takes her dog and she actually pays like $25 to take it to a park on the other side. And, you know, people love their pets now. Sometimes they'll say, I'm going to take my dog, but I'll leave my spouse at home. And it's just so important, I think, for us to have a dog park. And it's got to be convenient for, for our people. Thank you so much for allowing us to come in and talk with you today. Thank you. Anyone have any questions? Thank you, Charlene. Thank you. Thank you. Charlene happens to be the events coordinator for our club. And she's got two large uh, events coming up that will bring us quite a bit of money in. And right now, we don't have that money earmarked for nothing. Uh, the next one I want you to speak to with is, uh, and probably most of you know her, Leslie Carter. She's with Ridgeview Bank. She's the secret, or she's the treasurer of the club, and she manages our bills and keeps everybody paid. 
Hello, I'll go on what Terry said. Um, working at Ridgeview, we see every day people in that field beside us, um, probably four families per day, easy. Um, but Reba just asked me to speak on why I think it's important to have a dog park at the Westlake area. And I think having a spot for everyone to go, it's just not about giving our furry friends a place to play. It's, a, it's about fostering a sense of community among pet owners and providing a safe, clean space for our dogs to exercise and socialize. Um, it's important for our dogs to have regular activity and just having a place for them to go. For us to be able to meet new people, for our dogs to meet new people would be important. So that's kind of all I had. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate it. So now we'll get down to why we need it. All right, Paul, I need you back. Okay, it, I have these glasses. Uh, <laughs> It says that a dog park should be relatively flat. And as you all know, that is definitely a flat piece of property out there. And so that would be make it a perfect place for us. The next one is, um, it says not to put it near ex other existing dog parks. Well, the only one that I know of that's even gonna be close to us is the one they're building in Rocky Mount. And um, I don't know when they'll open, but I know Salem has opened several new ones and larger. Each time it's larger. Uh, Lynchburg has got a ton of them. Uh, I went to look at Danville. They have got many, many of them. And so we would be the only one in Franklin County other than Rocky Mounts. And um, I think for, our, I know Rocky Mount is more, you got more land to walk your dogs. You're more like me. I've got a large yard, I've got, you know, land. But I paid $25 for Buddy to go and play with other dogs because he gets lonely. And so, you know, a lot of people are like me, they love their dog. <laughs> and so we, but we, this would be a, a great place. Okay, the other one it says the site should have sufficient parking. Well, here's the reason I thought about that place because you all own that whole street. And uh, what I was thinking is we would build the dog park and then, uh, but what I'm asking for is an acre. So a half acre would be my dog park and the other half I would build a parking lot. So if you all decide to use the other 14 acres, then you would share the parking lot. So that's why I wanted to put a parking lot between the dog park and the other land. But I do think that if you put a, the dog park there and dress it pretty, as you all know, I would not hand you something that was not nice looking. It would have a chain link fence. We could put uh, Leland's around it. And if you want them to be close, they grow 10 foot. I can make them grow five foot a year by simply putting a water bucket each one of them. And we can take care of that. If there ever comes a point that you all don't like the water, the dog park no more, and you say, hey, we're done, we'll pull the fence up and it's gone. So you're not, you know, it's not like you're giving me the title to it. I'm only giving you all the project to enjoy. But if you don't like it, say a year from now, we'll jerk the fence up and it's gone. We're out a little bit of money and that's it. Okay, so now we'll move on to the next one. This is my chart. And I think you all got a copy of this chart. And it pretty much explains in detail to you all the requirements of things that you would need for the dog park. So there's no point in me going over those because y'all are not kindergarten children. You're highly intelligent individuals that I think the world of. So you all can figure this out simply by looking at it. Okay, so we're not gonna go over all that. All right, the dog park. A dog park needs to be a minimum of a half an acre. And that's what I've asked for. <coughs> it needs to be enclosed by a six foot fence. It will be enclosed by a nice <coughs> chain link fence. It will have two openings, one to go into the park and it will be closed off. And then a second gate that will open that will allow the dogs to go out into the main purpose. We can limit the number of dogs per 
being there at one time. Mo a lot of the parks do it. They limit it to four dogs, five dogs, and it can be divided in two sections, large dogs, small dogs, so that we have a lot of control over it. The surface material for the, for the walk inside, I was thinking we would have to know, you don't do a dog park with grass. You do it with very, very, very fine stone. It's almost like a BB type stone. It's very small. It keeps the odor down. It's very easy to clean. And um, so it would have to be, once it's put in, uh, once a year, you would probably just resurface it very lightly. So that's a very small amount of cost. And we also need about 10 to 20 parking spaces. And that's about, I think at the trail, I think I built you all about 20 to 30 parking spaces. And that was a very minimum cost to me. So same thing here. So uh, the other thing was we would have water, which the, that area, that lot has got water. that's already watered there. All we have to do is put in a faucet the homeowners will be responsible for bring their own water dishes so that their dog does not drink after another dog. So that would be their responsibility. They will have the responsibility of cleaning after their dog. And, uh, but we will put in pretty play equipment to make it look de decorative. Now, if you'll put this one up for me. <laughs> this chart here, and I really like this chart. This is the demand um, of the things people would like to see. So the first one was a splash park. And that's something I'm gonna come after you all on that other 14 acres. <laughs> but I know something that you all don't know and I can't tell you about the 500 acres, but you will be pleased when you do find it. Now, splash park will belong to, that land will still be yours. Dog park. Look here, that was the second highest demand was a dog park. And those two things fall hand in hand for that 15 acres, a dog park and a children's park. That would be awesome for that neighborhood and to bring a lot of people to Franklin County and bring money to Franklin County. Okay, the next one is the construction. This is the part that is the good part. Okay, you got my construction. Uh, let's see here, there we go. All right, the dog part is gonna cost me roughly, let me turn, open this up here. Okay, we're gonna compare Rocky Mount's cost to our cost. I've got theirs too. So Rocky Mount has predicted that it's gonna cost them $50,500 to build their dog park. But they are putting in hardtop parking lot. They're putting in, uh, they have to install a lot more things than we do because they don't have the, some of the things that we've got out there, like the water is very accessible and all that stuff. And uh, so here was my budget. For the fencing, it's gonna, and this is roughly, could give or take a couple thousand dollars. The fencing, roughly $20,000. For the parking lot, a gravel parking lot, it'll run me $5,000. For the gravel, for the inside of the park, which will be a half an acre, it's gonna cost me $3,000. For the uh, water, for the, for the fountain, and I'm hoping that I don't have to pay a big hookup fee to hook a faucet there. And uh, so, but anyway, I put 500 for the faucet. The uh, waste station, we will have a waste station with the bags and we'll have trash cans and uh, we will keep that stocked. That would be another $300. My park benches, naturally, I will be furnishing those probably, but I put 500 just so I can make y'all think this is gonna cost me more. <laughs> and my water bowls will be furnished by the homeowners. So a total estimate of this is gonna be between $30,000 and $35,000. Now, we've already got over half of this money in place. And uh, we've got, well, actually, we've got the money, but we've got two projects that we're kind of buying. 
but there's no problem with us coming up with the money. Now we just need to come up with a spot. So the last thing that is the operational cost. This is something that will interest you all. Okay. You have to have trash cans and bags and they have to be emptied. So we allowed $300 for the station and the bags per year. Dog bags was 100. Land maintenance, that means the only thing that I can think of that we'll have to do is around the fence will have to be weeded. And uh, we'll keep that done. And that would be done at least twice a month. So then we're, but we allowed to pay a person um, for the maintenance $6,000. That would allow us to have a person do it for about one hour, maybe twice or three times a week, and we'd pay them $15 an hour. My suggestion is maybe, and I talked to Paul, but we this is not confirmed, this is just hypothetical, that the guys that work at the trash dump are retired. We could offer them $15 an hour, twice a week or three days a week to walk over to the dog park and into the trash cans and that would pay to, for the maintenance. So the next thing was the keeping the fences up, uh, keeping our signs nice and clean and pretty. And the total cost of that, I estimated to be anywhere from $8,000 to $10,000 a year. Now, if that is something that we would cover, but let's say the county, and Paul and I talked about this, as things grow and everything, let's say the county decides, okay, we're gonna take it over as, as county. Do you know that that is 10,000 a year would be the main, the cost for it. So it's not a big project, but it's something that the people truly want and would truly like to see. And I have a secret for you all that I really want to share with you that I was amazed. I did my research on dog parks. And so I thought, you know, I'm just gonna look up several. I found there is 73 dog parks between Lynchburg and Salem and Martinsville and Danville and Dillwyn. There is 73 paid dog parks. Did you all realize there's paid dog parks? Mm -hmm. And the ones that I, I made a copy, and do you know they charge any words, for, most of them charge $10 an hour, and you have to make an appointment to take your dog. <laughs> one of them charges 15 an hour. And, and um, the one that I take my dog to in Bedford is 25. And I have to call a week in advance. And this, I didn't realize there's 73 businesses that are charging for dog parks. So, you know, it, it was amazing to me because I had never thought about that. So what I'm doing is asking you guys to think about what we proposed and decide is it something you want? Is it something I can build and give you? Need your vote. Anyone have any questions for Rita? I'd like to Go say ahead. something if I may, Mr. Chair. I want you all couldn't possibly have questions as much as we can throw at you. <laughs> Reba, I'd just like to first off by thanking you. Um, your philanthropy and your commitment to Franklin County is is unparalleled. And we are so grateful for you and we're we're so grateful for your compassion for recreation in the county and and paul my appreciation greatly to you for supporting reba and supporting uh, her committee so thank you for that and um, i would share with the board um, i am i would be so proud to have a dog park uh, in the westlake area and since this started hitting the newspaper which it did a, a while back I've gotten a lot of feedback from residents who are very excited about it. And um, I think it's an amenity that um, if you have it, great, but if you don't have it, it is certainly a void in how we take care of the amenities in our community. 
And I can tell you that there are other housing developments coming to the Westlake area. And so the numbers that have been quoted in addition to other things that are coming to Westlake, um, the demand on services, um, both commercial and recreational amenities um, and infrastructure is going to continue to be on the increase. Um, so I would love to have this uh, in the Westlake area. I think we've got a perfect place for it and it's highly accessible. It's very safe. Um, and, and so Reba, I appreciate the money you all have raised uh, is significant. And um, I think that this operating budget of eight to $10,000 a year for the actual return on the investment that we will get as a county, um, especially as part of an economic development package, again, I think uh, will be remarkable. Anyone else? Go ahead. Thank you, Reba. And my only question is, is, and Paul, this might be a question for you, is who is going to enforce these rules? Because I know how people get about their dogs. I got a little Yorkie myself. And uh, I know people will get irate about some of these things. And I just want to know what's, what phone number is going to be posted and who are they going to call that's going to enforce this? I think probably for the first year, uh, we need to actually have a caretaker to actually, you know, really make sure that people understand that uh, if we see an aggressive dog, you will leave. You will not be allowed to come back. Uh, at least for the first year, we need to uh, be very strict on it. And uh, I think I plan to have a volunteer program of people that will volunteer to, you know, be there. Uh, will you know watch over it? And I think once people realize how strict we are, you know, we can even put camera. I talked to Paul about that. We can actually put cameras out there, but I think that once people realize, hey, if we do, we don't clean up after our dog, or we take our dog in and he starts growling, they're not going to let us come back. And it only takes three or four to be stopped for the word to spread. And then I think at that point, we won't have a, a problem with it. But I think we, like you said, I think the first year it will have to be monitored very, very, very tightly. If you wouldn't mind, I can speak to that to some degree. Sure. Um, in Franklin County now, we have a lot of public parks. Those public parks have rules. We don't have police that go out there every day and monitor those rules and make sure that they're adhered to. A lot of it's done by patronage. The people that go to the parks, they want those parks to be wonderful. They want them to stay the way they are. They kind of self-enforce those rules to make sure that those rules are done. If there is some grand violation, it's something like a safety concern or something, we always thought like local law enforcement if something crazy goes on, but that's an incredible rare situation. In this situation, you have people who love their dogs, they want their dogs to be in a wonderful place. You're gonna see patronage enforcement of these rules well beyond anything any staff member would ever do or anyone else. So I think because everybody wants it to be a good situation, everybody wants the dog park, and nobody really wants it to be in a place where it's not gonna stay because if there's constant problems, the county's gonna say this is more of a problem than a benefit, we're gonna remove it. So I think the people who use it are going to easily take care of enforcing these rules more than anybody else we would ever put out there. But I think we have to look at it like we do with any public park. We have to have our citizenry be responsible and basically take care of it. Because if it's no different than if you're at Wade Park or if you're at Smith Mountain at the, at the, at the uh, park there, uh, the people there are going to have to help out and help us do that. We are very confident based upon everything we've seen that there is no question that these people are going to take care of this park and do it, do it better than anybody we could hire. So I think that's how you're going to have your rules enforced. I think they're going to be enforced well. If there is something very unusual, I think you're going to have people step up and come and say, we're going to take care of this. And the reason why you know that is because of the amazing outreach we've had to put it in. No one's going to get this kind of popularity to try to put this park in and then say, but we're not going to maintain it. We're not going to do anything with it. We're just going to let it go run crazy. We're going to let anything that can have it. That's just not going to happen. So I think what we have to do is rely on our citizenry, and I don't think there's any question we're going to have that support. It's kind of like Nick with the trail. I've got my phone number. I mean, everybody's got my phone number, my email. <laughs> and when a tree falls or a limb needs to be trimmed, I get a phone call and I go up there and I take care of it. And I think that's what we, you know, for the first year, we will make sure there is numbers and people, uh, 
you know, and we can even put a sign that says, if you see someone uh, not, you know, obeying the rules, so please call, you know, and that way, like Tim said, I think the community will, because when we did the fundraiser, we had over 300 people at $100 a ticket on the tickets, and we were sold out within two weeks. So it shows you how bad people really want this park. And, um, but yeah, you're right. That would be one of my concerns, and I think we will address it very heavily. Good enough. Thank you, Rayburn. You're welcome. Can I add just a little bit onto that, sure. uh, Mr. Mitchell? Yeah, I think one of the things that um, w we need to do a good job at is what kind of arrangement is this going to be? Is this going to be a, uh, are we going to develop an MOU with um, with Reba and her recreation uh, group that they're going to maintain this? Or is this going to be something that they're going to raise the funds and give that to the county and the county maintains it? I guess it's, um, and, and the two, this is just assuming that we're okay with the slight selection. Wherever this goes, what kind of arrangement is this going to be? Um, but it's like the management aspect goes. I I guess in some ways there's there's pros both on both sides i guess one of the things that um one thing that i guess i like to promote a little bit is that um the model where it's um funds are raised and the county maintains it is there's um I think you'd have county staff going there, being, being the monitor there that's going there once a day. We have like site supervisors and we have um, park attendants that go there and at our other parks and are well aware and kind of keep an eye on things. Um, so that kind of model um, <clears throat> might work out, um, you know, as, as far as a long term thing. So, and because whatever's done, it's going to be here for, we could just, there was always the option of like pull up the fence and leaving, but it, we hope this thing is here and successful for. You know, decades and decades, and so you know, long after we're gone, you know, who's upkeeping it? So, I guess um, I'm, I think a, a dog park would be very, um, you know, successful. But you know, is it going to be well maintained? And maybe if the, um, you know, the county took on Reba and her group, they raised the funds, and the county built it, so it's you know, built appropriately, and then the, um, and then we oversaw it. That might be one option that might. Um, meet those um, questions that you might have. You right. know, I wish, Nick, that I wish I could stand here and tell you all um, about 500 acres across from Bojangles, but I can't because <laughs> there is a disclosure on it. But <laughs> I will tell you that if it passes and it closes on in 30 days, you're looking at a six to seven million dollar project on seven million dollars of land. And this dog park would be the number one benefit to walk hand in hand. So my fingers are crossed, you know, that that's gonna go through. But you know, the thing about it is, the things that I offer, the lake, there is people at the lake that feel like they don't want anybody else there but them. But you know what? We've got a gold mines that we can ride on and let's do it and build Franklin County the best county there is. Anybody else? Uh, the liability, I assume Chris comes back to the county, right? It's county property, it, it, it would be um, you know, Fall on, okay. on our risk management, yes sir. If that's the location of, you know, if this. I think the, um, the uh, information that Mr. Bird provided was very insightful. Uh, with regard to our other parks we have horses at wade park for goodness sake um, you know the the umbrella is quite wide and broad so um, i think that considering this under that same premise of being a public park makes sense and with regard to county ownership or uh, control if you will versus under the auspices of Reba's group um, in as much as I have so much appreciation for your group Reba um, we are all in everything we do volunteers volunteerism and I don't care what it is whether it's your group or anybody else um, you can't look at it as a sustainable model necessarily and um, so for that reason I think it should be county under the auspices of the county so that we can make sure that this does what it needs to do um, and the numbers you've provided are more than reasonable. I think y'all need to realize everything that we build for you, we will pay for it, but then we're handing it to you and you all take it from there. All right, 
we need to move right along. Thank you, Reba. Um, this is definitely thought provoking, and I think we need to, Mr. Whitlow, for our August agenda, uh, we don't need to keep Reba in limbo. We need to have this on the August agenda for some action and so that we can give her. I would say now, but it's not on my agenda to take action today, but I think we need to, to be fair to you and, and your group. We need to give them a decision uh, one way or the other and see if we can do that in August. I just have some questions, I guess. It, you know, is it, is it a consensus then that, you know, this particular piece of property, is this the location, the size, scope, the other thing, in, in terms of staff bringing back, you know, uh, a summary or a recommendation, you know, I don't, I don't know where the board may be. I mean, we, we certainly could take the information that we've been provided today and share that, but I'm not sure where the board may be. I'd like to go take a look before I see it. And I, I intend to go ride down there myself and take a look at it just so that a I can. long time since I've been down there. Yeah. Yeah. Vice, Mr. Vice Chair, I think we could, um, what I would like to see um, is we could perhaps have an executive summary on this, Mr. Whitlow, uh, that captures um, the real, um, you know, detail with regard to operating uh, versus uh, operating expenses, the revenue be identified, um, and then whether it's an MOU or, um, and an MOU may, may help, um, but then a recommendation put together for, um, to do this on that site, on that parcel of land, um, and that can be laid out with whatever detail is required. Um, and in the interim, if supervisors that go out there before the August meeting, if you have concerns, I would love for you to let me know what they are, and, and, and Mr. Whitlow as well, um, but we need to really be in a place to answer any and all questions. It's really important that there's complete transparency and information. But I would love to see us get to a place in August that you feel you have what you need to make a, a good decision. Absolutely. Anyone else? I would also, you know, add as part of the, and we'll, we can bring, staff can bring this information back there. I think there is some question regarding, um, you know, if, if this specific parcel, if that's what I'm hearing from the board for us to investigate this parcel further, we can do that and we can bring that information back and we will. Um, there is uh, a possible amendment that would be required for that property um, with the master plan of the Lake Watch property, a zoning amendment. So there, there are some steps mm -hmm. of, you know, um, due diligence steps, if you will, from the Planning Commission and the Board of Supervisors in terms of our rezoning. That, and we can float that. I'm looking at planning staff the zoning administrator and so forth but we we can float that back with our legal counsel and try to frame some information back if that's helpful for the board so mr vice chair i would like to know if there's consensus with the board for this parcel that's very important as we proceed uh, and give direction to staff so would you be kind enough to solicit the board sure for that what's your pleasure on the consensus on looking at this parcel Fine. That, that's helpful for us. Thank you all so. so much. Thank you. And Reba, August, hopefully we can give you a definite answer because you deserve it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Moving right along, legislative agenda discussion. Mr. Whitlow. Yes, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the board, uh, you all have in front of you a lot of information. Um, and so it's that time of the year, and actually we're trying to get a jump on it. Um, for those that uh, were able to attend last week, um, the VACO meeting up in Floyd, um, we, several things, and you'll, you'll have in front of you that, the one, I'll, I'll start probably with the back, it's the larger one, it's called the VACO Legislative Summary. This is the booklet that uh, Chairman Thompson was referring to on Tuesday, a lot of information there. This is all the legislation summary that was passed in the General Assembly. Um, probably a lot of unfunded mandates in this one too as we keep talking about <laughs> unfunded mandates, but um, especially that the speed limit, the other stuff too, it's all summarized here. Um, and, and going from the back, you'll see the Regional Commission, the Roanoke Regional Commission, legislative priorities. Um, you have a copy of that. You have a copy of the actual VACO legislative program from last year, 2024. 
and the priority summary sheet. And then you have the county's 2024 legislative priorities. You, if you'll recall, we did these cards, these summary sheets. Uh, and then you have the more formal legislative uh, agenda here for our legislators. And of course, le in previous years, we have met with our legislators in November to have a legislative lunch and we bring them in, we sit down, and that's around the time frame that a lot of the organizations, the chambers of commerce in the region, the regional commissions and so forth, they typically do that in November before the General Assembly gets underway there in December and early um, January. That being said, a lot of the feedback from our legislators this year has been um, they would like for us to get ahead of this a little sooner um, because if we wait till November, we're, we're almost waiting too long for them to actually have any meaningful dialogue between the various um, members in the General Assembly that they may could do something for. So um, last week was a good um, kickoff at the VACO meeting in Floyd, and of course Supervisor Smith put this together and spoke on behalf of the Board of Supervisors uh, last week with just some preview legislative priorities. And so what we would like to do um, uh, is, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the boards, maybe have some discussion today generally. I know we have another 5.30 <coughs> meeting, <coughs> but... Um, what we'd like to do is bring some of this back uh, more formalized at your August meeting and actually have the board um, potentially adopt a legislative agenda in August and actually move um, our legislative uh, luncheon from the legislators. I know we sent out save the date November 19th. I'm looking at Amy, our clerk, to say, well, we may be sending another one out, but pleasure the board that we move that up, Mr. Chairman, to, to, to our September board meeting date. Um, to meet with those legislators and of course mr chairman uh, mr chairman thompson rather had mentioned that um, delegate win williams who um, is no longer represents franklin county per se but i think he chairs the transportation committee uh, not chairs the transportation He's committee is on, on the transportation committee thank you miss smith um, he had he had um, expressed that yes if there's anything even from a neighboring locality like franklin county that would have interest he would certainly be of interest and i'm sure there are others delegate uh, terry austin and other discussions so uh, i know um, supervisor smith has worked diligently last year uh, to help put that together for the board um, and did so last week for the summary so Mr. Chairman, she may have more um, comments and can certainly speak to a lot of these than I am because I know she's also working with that with the Regional Commission in Roanoke. So I'll, I'll pause there and whatever the pleasure of the board may be, but we wanted to get all these documents in front of you all where we can really start crafting in and honing in on a legislative agenda and potentially having something together for board action in August and then meet with the legislators in September. Or do you have anything you want to add? Um, because we are time constrained, what would have been nice is to work or just go through each bullet and have the board say, I support it or take it out. Um, I don't think we have the time to do that, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, so I don't know if you all have had a chance to look at this document. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions um, as you would do a quick perusal of that. Um, what I guess I would say at this point is if you have any um, questions, concerns, or requests for additions or deletions, if you could just let me know that um, perhaps by the end of, of the month, first week of August, then I will be able to get this document compiled and get it in formal uh, printing for our card and all, um, and we'll adopt it at our August meeting. Uh, and I, I definitely, we have some real benefit going on, some really good attention from a few of our legislators with regard to some of our priorities. And so the goal that we as a board need to make a determination on is to pick two or three of these priorities, not areas, but the individual priorities, pick these, make these our, our um, top of mind items where we're gonna probably um, a few of us will sit down with some of our legislators, roll our sleeves up, and make some determination about actual action items that we can go after in the upcoming session, rather than you know just saying we don't like unfunded mandates. We don't, that will always live in this document, but let's figure out how we create action items, 
how we get something done actually and we're in the second year of the biennium budget yes but there's a lot we can get done in terms of budget amendments earmarks and so forth so um, if you all would be willing to provide me your feedback by the end of the month um, I would be happy would love that um, and if I don't hear anything I will assume that you're okay with with what we've submitted but please please make sure that these things reflect your thinking and any questions concerns mr. Carter yeah just a comment I brought up about the money we're spending and under CSA mm -hmm. I think we should put uh, a percentage and maybe work with mr. Carter and say in the last year it's gone up 20 percent the year before it went up whatever and put in bold print a dollar amount that we would like to that we're spending just okay. to just okay. so they'll be aware of in black and white what it's really costing I think that's a great idea and if the board determines and you know, when you give me your feedback I really want to know what your top three areas are you so know and and so priorities. I'm here in CSA um, and you know if you all can give me some concurrence around that um, that would be great and I think mr. Carter your points well taken and at the regional or the district meeting last week we heard other localities in the region we were all singing from the same hymnal um, so CSA is, is that something that you all want to make one of your top three priorities yes Marshall Dan okay fair enough and I am suspecting transportation I'm praying that you all would have that at the top of our list there's a lot of work that I'm doing behind the scenes uh, with legislators and I'm, I'm got a tentative meeting set with Terry Austin who is the chairman of the transportation committee for the General Assembly um, and so if you all concur I would love to make transportation one of our priorities if you would concur with that and the sales tax because I think it's very discriminatory how they've allowed some counties to do that and not others yes let me mark that Mike <clears throat> I'm having to, oh there it is okay are there any other things that you all would like to give me any feedback on today um, Mr. Whitlow yeah if I, if I may um, Ms. Smith uh, to Mr. Supervisor Carter's point about the CSA dollar amounts yes. maybe in our cards I, I just wanted to point out and um, uh, as you all know the next one there the school resource officers and that dedicated revenue stream and um, Mr. Brian Carter had shared this with me the other day that um, you know we know once those SRO grants expire there's significant dollars and just for the board's awareness in FY 26 um, that's an $80,000 hit that we'll have to make up in 2027 that's another 323,000 uh, in 2028 another 324 that's that million two million so to supervisor Mike Carter's point I think that that's a good suggestion maybe for our card do we actually put the fiscal impact number and those great. numbers are significant so I thought that, that was a good suggestion so great um, I would tell you that um, you know I'm working on the Roanoke Allegheny Regional uh, agenda legislative agenda as well as VACO um, had some feedback through the general government committee that I'm vice chair of and there is there is a good theme and commonality on these agenda items which is a really good thing for us because these things you know the legislators will look at what's getting the attention and there these things are becoming very consistent priorities and that's that's a ball in our court on that so just to let you know that but um, I think the numbers mr. Carter is a good thing we can do for for CSA as well as the school re resource officer and when I ask you about those top um, three my three priorities as an example we need to not only say that that is what it is but as I work on this we need to decide what is the ask as an example on the transportation piece I think I put it somewhere a budget amendment that's a very specific ask on the particular code section where this uh, transportation division puts 25 million dollars lid on secondary road funding 
So how do we get more secondary road funding into the Commonwealth, into rural counties? A proposal might be that we ask to raise that ceiling to $50 million, right? Um, and the other pair, the pairing to that is where we've set a men comes before a dedicated revenue stream um, in the transportation budget that's not taking money away from something else, but get the state to acknowledge a brand new revenue stream for counties for secondary road purposes. So when you think about these top three priorities, think about what is it we would like to ask for? Because when we ask for something, that gives the legislators something that's going to require them to do some due diligence. And it's, it's not just listing a couple things on a card. Does that make sense? One thing, too, Lori, and I don't know how to work it into it, but we are one of the few counties that does not border Interstate 81, and we are paying into that fund for that road. So Yes, we are. Got to ask to have be withdrawn from that, or ask for our portion of that money to come back to Franklin County. Is it something like seven cents, Mr. Whitlow? On, I don't on the think gas? it's. It, I don't know if it's quite seven, but it. Okay. it but in, in that range, three or four cents. It, yeah. Mm. yeah, yeah. It's significant though with gas prices. Yeah. <laughs> <where they're, laughs> so I would appreciate you guys um, getting back with me um, if you concur with this. Want changes to it? And then if you would identify your top three priorities, and then if you have any idea about how we could achieve those top three priorities, that would be very helpful. So um, just a couple of comments issued from the hip. I, I think back to the session, and this is before I was in the position uh, with Bill Stanley, and you prepared a really nice card, did a really nice job of presenting our needs, but it, it really felt like he was almost not in a position to help and at all on any on any of your points and so it makes me wonder how could we use a different approach to get what we want not for an answer now it's just like this when i i think back to the bill stanley meeting and i think about okay how, how do you get what you want instead of well you're not going to get what you want the second thing it's this is a long list of things and the, the longer the list gets, gets it you really diffuse your oh, energy yeah. right and so it'd be really nice i think you were getting to a couple items as opposed to many many items and then uh the third thing under housing after our builder developer forum and sewer was identified as the number one thing mm -hmm. it, it's it's not incentives aren't really sewer right incentives are well I'll give you tax relief for so many years, right? That's what they think about with incentives. And, and I think that um, it might be good under housing to identify sewer uh, as something very important since it was identified to us. And then the last thing, um, again, just quick observations on the, I'm all for getting more money for the schools. However, a sales tax is a very regressive tax. It, it hits the poor, right? It, um, it doesn't hit the wealthy people as much. And so um, it always makes me cringe to see a sales tax go up when I know we have so many people in the county that are financially challenged. And, the, and this a sales tax like this hits those financially challenged people. So it just makes me wonder, is there another way to get the money? Because I'm all for getting the money for the schools. This, is a, this, this hits harder on the poor. Well, keep in mind that this would operate under the auspices or not of a referendum mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, that this legislation the other counties have is require a, a referendum to mm -hmm. for the people to yeah. vote on it mm -hmm. and you know yeah and and i disagree with you on one thing i don't think that it unfairly uh, affects the poor more than any, anyone else i think in this case a sales tax is a user tax and it's the, probably the most fair tax that we have the ones that are going to pay the most are the ones that spend the most. And the ones that spend the most are the ones that have the most to spend. And so for me, the sales tax is you know, sort of like your meals tax. It's a fair tax. It's, it's based on use. And uh, unlike our you know, recent uh, tax changes with our property taxes where some people saw their taxes go up and other people saw their taxes go down based on uh, assessments, this is to me is a fair tax across the board mm -hmm. so, i mean we we'll just have to respectfully disagree on on our opinions of sales tax but it is done by referendum so the people would have an opportunity to vote on it and i think that it's important that all the counties in the state of virginia 
be treated fairly and there were seven or eight counties that were allowed to do this and I think it's only fair that the, the rest of the counties in the state get the same opportunity not not to say that it would pass but uh, I think that we should have that opportunity and that's what we're asking for is the opportunity mm -hmm. to let the people decide and it passed the house and the senate yeah this it, year yeah but governor so, Youngkin vetoed it yeah um, so they need we need to apply some pressure in, in that direction too as well anyone else and I look at it too though I look at it from the business end how's it going to affect the business our local business so I don't know I'd have to look at it and see you know but if um, I can go out of another county and buy a car five hundred dollars cheaper I mean I just that's one point I'm wondering about one question I got anyone else all right not seeing any at this time we're going to break for dinner and it's my understanding the Farm Bureau has a meal prepared for us in B-75 so we will be relocating to B-75. <laughs>